കേബിൾ ടു ഒരു അസോസിയേഷൻ ഉണ്ട് ബാംഗ്ലൂർ ബേസ്ഡ് ആയിട്ട് സോ ഏബിൾ ഹാസ് കം അപ്പ് വിത്ത് റിപ്പോർട്ട് ഫോർ ദ ബയോ എക്കോണമി റിപ്പോർട്ട് സോ ഫ്രീ റിപ്പോർട്ട് ഐ ഷെയർ വിത്ത് യു സോ ദാറ്റ് ഷോസ് ദ സെക്ടേഴ്സ് ഓഫ് ദ ബയോ എക്കോണമി ഐ ഡിഡ് ഹാവ് ഇൻ ദ പ്രസൻറ്റേഷൻ ഐ ജസ്റ്റ് ടുക്ക് ഇറ്റ് ഓഫ് ബിക്കോസ് സ്ലൈഡ്സ് ഓർ ടു മച്ച് നോർമലി ഐ ടോക്ക് ടു ലോങ് ആൻഡ് ഇറ്റ് ടേക്സ് ടു മച്ച് ടൈം ബട്ട് ഐ കൻ ഷെയർ ദാറ്റ് ഇറ്റ് സോ ദ ഫാ ദ ത്രീ ഹൺഡ്രഡ് ബില്യൺ ഡോളർ എക്കോണമി ഇസ് വാട്ട് ദ എക്സ്പെക്ട് ദ ബയോ എക്കോണമി ടു ഗ്രോ ടു നൗ ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് അബൌട്ട് എയ്റ്റി ടു ഹൺഡ്രഡ് ബില്യൺ ദിസ് ഇയർ ഇൻ ഇന്ത്യ ഇന്ത്യസ് ബയോ എക്കോണമി സൈസ് ബട്ട് ഫിഫ്റ്റി പെർസെൻറ്റ് ഇസ് ബൈ ഫാർമ but like dr ramchand mentioned earlier it's all old technology we are not making any new medicines we are like 30 years behind but still we are making a lot of medicines i mean you know we are suppliers for the world right about 50 60% of the generics go from india so it's good i am not saying the pharmaceutical industry was a bad thing uh, but there is lot more to be done so that is one then there is diagnosis also they put under bioeconomy uh, they put all enzymes chemicals everything under bioeconomy so they have broken that into sectors and uh, Uh, that they have shown the 80 billion then they are shown by 20 30 how to go to 300 billion so i think it will be much more my personal belief is that the 300 billion is a lower estimate for the bio economy anyone else ah oh, very pre ah oh. pre medical screening is the most important thing i would i would suggest and other societies have done it ഈവൻ മച്ച് ഏർലിയർ ഇത്രയും ജിനോം സീക്വൻസിങ് ഒക്കെ വരുന്നതിന് മുന്നേ തന്നെ ജസ്റ്റ് ഫ്യൂ ജീൻസ് നോക്കിയിട്ട് അഷ്കനാസി ജ്യൂസ് നമ്മളെ പോലത്തെ പ്രോബ്ലം ഉണ്ട് ഇസ്രയേലിൽ ഇസ്രയേലിൽ ലോകത്ത് പലയിടത്തും ഉണ്ട് അഷ്കനാസി ജ്യൂസ് ഒരു ത്രീ തൗസൻഡ് ഇയേഴ്സ് ആയിട്ട് ബ്രീഡ് ചെയ്തിട്ടില്ല ഇൻ്റർ ബ്രീഡ് ചെയ്തിട്ടില്ല ദ ബ്രീഡ് എമങ് ഡെംസെൽസ് അപ്പോൾ അവരുടെ വേണം എക്സ്ട്രീം ഇപ്പോൾ നോവൽ ലോറേജ് നോക്കിയാൽ എനിക്ക് തോന്നുന്നു ഒരു ഫിഫ്റ്റി സിക്സ്റ്റി പെർസെൻറ്റ് വുഡ് ബി അഷ്കനാസി ജ്യൂസ് സോ നേരത്തെ പറഞ്ഞ നോർമൽ കർവിൽ സോ യു ഗെറ്റ് എക്സ്ട്രീം ബ്രില്യൻ പീപ്പിൾ ആൻഡ് ബട്ട് യു ഗെറ്റ് എ ലോഡ് ഓഫ് ദി അതർ സൈഡ് ഓൾസോ a serious defect so they have one of the largest number indians kanya maybe second eye to third eye to verum ashkenazi jews in uh, genetic uh, disorders inherited disease so what they did was that they have you might know the rabbis rabbis are avare priests so avare endu chuchale rabbis vadi aakiya annu chala ningal rendu veru kalyanam kalikan thirumanchunnale your uh, gene sample you just send to the rabbi he will arrange the uh, testing and he will keep the results the result won't be shared with anyone റാബൈ പറയും നിങ്ങൾ ഒന്നീ കള്ളം കഴിക്കണ്ട അതേ കുറച്ച് പ്രശ്നങ്ങളുണ്ട് ഈ മൂന്ന് ഡിസീസസിന് ജീൻസ് നിങ്ങൾക്ക് രണ്ട് പേർക്കും ഉണ്ട് അല്ലെ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ ഇവർ കള്ളം കഴിച്ചോ കുട്ടികൾ വേണ്ട അല്ലെങ്കിൽ അന്ന് ടെക്നോളജി ഇല്ലായിരുന്നു സ്ക്രീൻ ചെയ്യാനൊന്നും അഡോപ്റ്റ് ചെയ്യോ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ അങ്ങനെ എന്തെങ്കിലും മതി ദാറ്റ് ടൈപ്പ് ഓഫ് അഡ്വൈസ് കിട്ടിയു എൻ്റെ സിക്സ്റ്റി ഫൈവ് ബ്രോസസ് ഒക്കെ ഒരു സെവൻറ്റി ടു എയ്റ്റി പെർസെൻറ്റ് ദേവർ റെഡ്യൂസ് ഇൻ ദ ലാസ്റ്റ് എയ്റ്റ് ടെൻ ഇയേഴ്സ് അത് വെറുതെ പറഞ്ഞാൽ ദിസ് എ പബ്ലിഷ് ഡേറ്റ സോ യു ക്യാൻ ലുക്ക് അറ്റ് പബ്ലിക് അവർക്ക് നമുക്ക് ഇവിടെ സിക്സ്റ്റി ഫൈവ് ബ്രോസസ് അധികമില്ല നമ്മുടെ പോപ്പുലേഷൻ ബട്ട് ഇൻ ജ്യൂസ് പോപ്പുലേഷൻ സിക്സ്റ്റി ഫൈവ് ബ്രോസസ് എ ലാർജസ്റ്റ് സിംഗിൾ ഇൻഹെറിറ്റഡ് ഡിസീസ് so by premarital screening they they were able to successfully reduce th- like that so there is a, what i am saying is that uh, there is clear evidence to show that it can be done but will we do it another uh, uh, we have to decide alle kana and the stigma und lack of understanding und pinne idu kaniya ini ipo kutram parayo kalyana nadakadirikyo divorce avu ha ella kai അതുകൊണ്ട് മാത്രമല്ല ഞാൻ നേരത്തെ പറഞ്ഞ കാരണങ്ങളുണ്ട് നമ്മുടെ കൺസേഗരിറ്റി യൂറോപ്യൻ മെഡിക്കൽ ഏജൻസി ഓസ്ട്രേലിയൻ റെഗുലേറ്ററി ഏജൻസീസ് ഇവിടെ എല്ലാം ഇതുപോലത്തെ റയർ ഡിസീസസിന് സപ്പോർട്ട് ചെയ്യാൻ ഓർഫൺ ഡ്രഗ്സ് ഡെവലപ്മെൻറ്റ് റിസർച്ച് ചെയ്യുന്നതിന് വേണ്ടിയിട്ട് അവർ ട്രൈ ചെയ്യുന്നത് പക്ഷെ ഇന്ത്യയിൽ ഇത്രയും കൂടുതൽ പോപ്പുലേഷൻസ് ഉണ്ടായിട്ട് റയർ ഡിസീസസിന് address like this because uh, one of my uh, family member got affected with this rare disease because of uh, this casinis marriages because, uh, uh, because, uh, because uh because of the uh, uh, so not so social norms yeah, yeah. social norms and also uh, blind ovum 
uh, cases were also reported. Yeah. So this has to be get greater. Yeah. Uh, no, we all agree. I know that nobody argues. Uh, Nirmala Sita Raman na statement is not there. Government also agrees. No. Our uh, ten year back, when we were talking, they were not even agreeing or listening. Ipo asy jo mari. Everybody agrees that the problem. Other you parne bolle, chale the personal experience la, allah toh the baaki allah statistics ko kitha. ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് ധാരാളം ഫാർമാസ് കമ്പനീസ് വെറുതെ ഞാൻ കുറേ ഹൈപ്പ് ഉണ്ടാക്കണം ഓഫൺ ഡ്രഗ്സ് ക്ലാസിഫിക്കേഷൻ വേണം അങ്ങനെ എങ്ങനെയെന്നൊക്കെ പറഞ്ഞു പക്ഷേ ഒരു വെസ്റ്റേൺ ഫാർമസ്യൂട്ടിക്കൽ വേൾഡിനൊന്നും ഒരു താല്പര്യവും ഇല്ല ഈ ഇന്ത്യയിലുള്ള ഒരു റെയർ ഡിസീസിന് മരുന്ന് ഉണ്ടാക്കിയിട്ട് എന്താ അവർക്ക് കിട്ടാൻ പോകുന്നത് അല്ലേ പ്രാക്ടിക്കൽ നോക്കിയാൽ അവർ നമ്മുടെ ഡ്രഗ് ആയാലും നമുക്ക് വേണ്ട ക്രോപ്സ് ആയാലും നമുക്ക് വേണ്ട കാര്യങ്ങളൊന്നും വേറെ ആരും ശ്രദ്ധിക്കാൻ പോകുന്നില്ല അത് നമ്മൾ തന്നെ സോൾവ് ചെയ്തേ പറ്റുള്ളൂ അത് ഡോക്ടർ രാമചന്ദ്രൻ മെൻഷൻ പോലെ നമ്മുടെ കമ്പനീസ് ഒന്നും പുതിയ ഡ്രഗ്സ് ഡെവലപ്പ് ചെയ്യുന്നില്ല നമ്മുടെ റിലേറ്റീവ് ഏജൻസീസ് ഒക്കെ വളരെ പിന്നിലാണ് ഇപ്പം ഡോക്ടർ രാമസു തന്നെ പറയാൻ ഡ്രൈവ് ചെയ്ത ആ സാക്സിൻ ഞാൻ ഒരു കമ്പനിയെ കാണിച്ചില്ലേ ഞങ്ങളുടെ ഡ്രഗ്ഗിന് തന്നെ ഫേസ് ഒന്നും അവർ തരുന്നുണ്ടായിരുന്നില്ല ട്വൻറ്റി ഫോർ ഫിഫ് സിക്സ്റ്റീനിലും സെവൻറ്റീനിലും എയ്റ്റീനിലും ഒക്കെ അപ്ലൈ ചെയ്യുമ്പോൾ ഇവിടെ ഫേസ് വൺ ആരും ചെയ്തിട്ടില്ല എന്നാണ് പറയുന്നത് അപ്പോൾ ഫേസ് വൺ ട്രയലിൽ നമുക്ക് അപ്രൂവൽ തരില്ല അതും ഇതും എല്ലാം പറഞ്ഞു നീട്ടിക്കൊണ്ട് പോകും ഇപ്പോൾ എന്നാൽ അത് മാറിയിട്ടുണ്ട് അപ്പോൾ ഇപ്പോൾ ദേ ഐ സി എം ആർ ലാസ്റ്റ് മന്ത് ഹാസ് കം അപ്പ് വിത്ത് പബ്ലിക്കേഷൻ ആസ്കിംഗ് ഫോർ പീപ്പിൾ ടു കം അപ്പ് വിത്ത് അപ്ലിക്കേഷൻസ് ഫോർ ഗെറ്റിംഗ് മണി ടു ഡു ഫേസ് വൺ ട്രയൽ ന്യൂ മോണിറ്റർ സോ ദേ ചേഞ്ചിങ് സോ ഐ നോട്ട് ചെയ്യിങ് ദാറ്റ് ദർ ഇസ് നോ ദർ ഇസ് നോട്ട് ചേഞ്ച് there is change but it is very little and uh, it is very challenging appo deham parnale namaka aadyate focus i think screening aanu cheaper naal thana cheyan pattunnu drug nu parayum companies ne kutta varanam pattadha nanu chale etra kollu edukku appo appo avaru nokkunna aaru paisa varu appo idu market illa adu paying market aanu orappillengile oru anju kollathiyo 10 kollathiyo oru journey ke oru company engine irangune right അപ്പോൾ അപ്പോൾ അതുകൊണ്ടൊക്കെ അങ്ങനെ കുറേ ഒരു ഇറ്റ്സ് എ വെരി കോംപ്ലക്സ് ദിസ് തിങ് പിന്നെ ഒരു റെയർ ഡിസീസിനെ ട്രീറ്റ് ചെയ്യാന്ന് പറഞ്ഞതും വെരി വെരി ഡിഫിക്കൽട്ട് മിക്ക റെയർ ഡിസീസിന് ബിക്കോസ് കുറേ ഡാമേജ് അങ്ങ് ഉണ്ടായി കാണും സോ സോ പിന്നെ ഒരു ഒരു എന്താ പറയുക ഒരു മെയിൻറ്റനൻസ് തെറാപ്പിയും ഒക്കെ വെച്ച് അങ്ങനെ പറ്റുള്ളൂ അപ്പോൾ റെയർ ഡിസീസിനെ അവോയ്ഡിങ് ആണ് ആ ദിസ് തിങ് പിന്നെ മോർ ഫോക്കസ് ഓൺ ന്യൂ തിങ്സ് ലൈക്ക് ഗീൻ എഡിറ്റി ഈ ഡ്രഗ്സ് ഒന്നും വേണ്ട അങ്ങനെ വെച്ച് മാനേജ് ചെയ്യാൻ എഡിറ്റ് ചെയ്യാൻ പറ്റിയാൽ നമ്മൾക്ക് വളരെ ഇതാണ് എഡിറ്റ് ചെയ്യാൻ തീർത്തിക്കലി പറ്റുമല്ലോ നമുക്ക് അറിയാൻ പറ്റുമല്ലോ നമുക്ക് കോഡ് വായിക്കാൻ പറ്റുന്നുണ്ട് കോഡിൽ പോയി നമുക്ക് ചേഞ്ച് ചെയ്യാനുള്ള ടെക്നോളജി നമുക്കുണ്ട് അപ്പോൾ നേരാണ് ഗവൺമെൻറ് റൺ ചെയ്യുന്നത് ഐ പുട്ട് മാസീവ് എമൗണ്ട്സ് ഓഫ് മണി ഓൺ ദ ന്യൂ ടെക്നോളജീസ് ഡ്രഗ്സ് ഒന്നും ഉണ്ടാക്കാൻ നോക്കില്ല ഇതിന് വേണ്ടിയിട്ട് ഇൻഹെറിറ്റഡ് ഡിസീസസ് കുറയ്ക്കാനായിട്ട് മേക്ക് ഷുവർ ഒരു സബ്സിഡൈസ്ഡ് സ്ക്രീനിങ് ഫോർ എവ്രി കപ്പിൾ ഓർ എവ്രി പേഴ്സൺ ഹു ആർ ഇസ് ഇൻട്രസ്റ്റഡ് റൈറ്റ് ജാതകം അയക്കുന്നതിന് പകരം നമുക്ക് ജനറ്റിക് ടെസ്റ്റ് റിപ്പോർട്ട് അയക്കാം കല്യാണത്തിന് മുന്നേ അപ്പോൾ ഒരു ഒരു മെത്തേഡ് അപ്പോൾ അങ്ങനെ അത് അത് എനേബിൾ ചെയ്യും അതുപോലെ ഓരോ സ്റ്റേജും ഒരു നാല് സ്റ്റേജായിട്ട് കാണാമല്ലോ പ്രീ മാരേജ് ആഫ്റ്റർ മാരേജ് ദെൻ പ്രീ കൺസെപ്ഷൻ പിന്നെ മേ ബി അത് ഒന്നും ചെയ്യാൻ പറ്റിയില്ലെങ്കിൽ ആഫ്റ്റർ കൺസെപ്ഷനെങ്കിലും ചെയ്യും ഞാൻ പറഞ്ഞ എൻ ഐ പി ടി അല്ലെങ്കിൽ അങ്ങനത്തെ വെർച്വലിറ്റി ചെയ്യും സോ ദാറ്റ് അറ്റ്ലീസ്റ്റ് യു യുനോ ഡിവെൻ കുട്ടിയെ ഉണ്ടാക്കി കഴിഞ്ഞിട്ട് പിന്നെ യുനോ അതിന് ട്രീറ്റ്മെൻറ്റ് കിട്ടുന്നില്ല അതിന് മരുന്നില്ല എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞിട്ട് നമ്മൾ പോകുന്നതിന് അവർ ഞാൻ മോശമാക്കി പറയല്ല പക്ഷേ ദ ചാലഞ്ചസ് ഓഫ് ബിക്കം സോ ബാഡ് അപ്പോൾ പിന്നെ ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് സോ ഡിഫിക്കൽട്ട് വി വിൽ ഹോപ്പ്ഫുള്ളി ഫിക്സ് ഇറ്റ് പക്ഷേ പ്രിവെൻഷൻ ഇസ് ബെറ്റർ ദാൻ ക്യൂർ എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് സോ ദീസ് തിങ്സ് വിൽ ഹെൽപ്പ് ഇൻ ദി പ്രിവെൻഷൻ ഓഫ് സച്ച് റയൽ ഡിസീസസ് യെസ് 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 ട്രീ ടെസ്റ്റിംഗ് യു നോ സ്ക്രീൻ വച്ച് ഓളി ദെൻ യു നോ അവോയ്ഡ് ദ ബേബി അങ്ങനെ ഉണ്ടാവാതിരിക്കാനുള്ള പ്രഷർ ഉണ്ട് ഇപ്പോൾ ഐ എഫ് ഒക്കെ ഉണ്ടല്ലോ അപ്പോൾ അപ്പോൾ നമ്മൾക്ക് അത് എല്ലാവർക്കും അഫോർഡ് ചെയ്യാൻ പറ്റില്ല അതുകൊണ്ടാണ് ഞാൻ ആദ്യം അത് പറയാൻ പക്ഷേ ഇപ്പോൾ മിക്കൊരു ചോദ്യം വരിക
So it's a, we are entering into a, like a, like a very and very murky field, le. I like that. Arangam brother, social norms are. Then the children, the marriage, the money, the children, jada gan chel chitti ano ani palu utlu hunkalana naar kanila. When you genetic, idu motion ano arjeni naala children, you are adding another problem. Okay, sir. Yeah. Parey. ുന്നു <laughs> 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 ഇപ്പം സ്നേക്ക് വലത്തിനൊക്കെ നല്ല ഇൻട്രസ്റ്റിങ് കാര്യങ്ങൾ നമുക്ക് വായിക്കുമ്പോൾ കേൾക്കാം എന്ത് ചെയ്യണം പിന്നെ അവസാനം പറയാമല്ലോ ഒരു നിവൃത്തിയില്ലെങ്കിൽ ഇങ്ങനെ പ്രാർത്ഥിച്ചിട്ട് ഇന്ന ചേലയെടുത്ത് കൊടുക്കും എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞാലേ അപ്പോൾ യാ മാഡം സർ ആൻഡ് ഡോക്ടർ ചെല്ലമ്മ ഗായനൊക്കെ എച്ച് ഓടി ഓക്കെ ഫസ്റ്റ് ഓഫ് ഓൾ ഐ ഐ വിൽ ടെൽ യു ദാറ്റ് യുവർ സ്റ്റോക്ക് വാസ് വെരി എക്സലൻസ് ടച്ച് ഓൾ ദി ആസ്പെക്ട്സ് റിഗാർഡിംഗ് ദ സ്ക്രീനിങ് വി ഓബ്സെറ്റീഷൻസ് യൂഷ്വലി സ്ക്രീൻ ഓൾ പേഷ്യൻസ് സ്ക്രീനിങ് Uh, in a uh, first final stage is a nasal bone nasal uh, nt etc and in high risk cases we as routine as you said ivf patients will do uh, uh, ad- genetic uh, studies and uh, the nip etc also will be done usually in high risk cases high risk cases only high risk. <laughs> and if it is uh, indicated we will do anya synthesis for your venous sampling etc yeah, yeah. and recently i had one patient my friend's daughter now she is in us and she is a primary gravida 28 year old primary gravida they had done the screening in early pregnancy itself there is no evidence of uh, down syndrome but they said there is a y chromosome deletion uh, mm. y chromosome deletion they had uh, and that is done in us mm. and they mm. are suggested an amnio synthesis and the next month they are planning to do the amnio synthesis I'm asking my doubt is what about the genetic editing in this type of cases? No, uh, editing has not been approved yet. So uh, like I said, even in the US, uh, only companies are going through clinical trials. So, okay. so, so, and also, I don't know how you'll handle a deletion. If it's huh. a deletion, uh, are, how, will, how can you fix the uh, editing? I mean, and they are tough, suspecting, no? uh, suspecting some uh, muscular diseases, yeah. maybe. Uh, so But it's a boy, right? So it's a boy. and it's not a sex intervention done, I don't know. And the Y chromosome, you won't have it. Deletion, no? which is written like it. Yeah, deletion yes. in the Y chromosome. So y basically chromosome. it's a boy. Maybe. Uh, it's okay. a boy. Hmm. So Y chromosome is very small. Uh, so, hmm. so, yeah. But Y chromosome is very important, right? Yeah. So, so uh, deletion most probably meaning that boy baby will have some significant problems. Uh, significant right? significant problems. Problem. Maybe 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 genital growth, uh, and dinary, uh, Maybe it's associated with some multiple multiple, multiple uh, problems. But from our experience, about uh, about from our experience, about three weeks. weeks. Ah, okay. uh, my, my experience, 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 it is is only 14 Okay. even though we advise that baby is having Down syndrome or some multiple the, the couple will will not uh, about. Uh, about. and they will not, uh, willing for termination. ജനിക്കോളജിബിൾ ടു റൈറ്റ് Okay. and then you are able to put back uh, whatever the set that was missing i mean manoj patu enengilu it takes some time and that's all the 10 20 years 30 years engil edukku when you are able to actually put uh, more of the miss deletion or a piece poi a copy appa aa piece namu tirich insert cheyana at the right place yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so it's a, it's a, it's a very big challenge thank you sir yeah yeah sorry ഓപ്ഷൻ <laughs> 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 NIPT over 
by uh, this thing. Uh, see, first of all, uh, all these technologies are useful. So there's no way to think like, oh, oh proteomics is lesser or uh, genomics is better and things like that. And that's why proteomics is not Proteomics is genes, genomics is genes and proteins. So, genes are not tested, proteins are not tested. It's not good. Right? But we have a complexity. We have a genes. We have a human being with genes. We have a code. We have a lot of technologies and methods. Proteomics is a number of fields. Proteomics and genomics are not good. 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 We have a new proteins. And there are um, technologies to look at proteomics. So proteomics is a difficulty in the Proteo, Proteins are like hundreds of thousands of proteins. Right? And above, uh, kind of, it's a genes are not in English, same genes are split, and combine them. Large numbers of proteins are made. But proteomics is a limited item. Above, large number of proteins are there in very small quantities. But they are very important. But most of the current proteomics technologies are the old. Now, the new technologies are very old. But in the last 3-4 years, Mumbai and all the technologies are very small quantity of proteins. What is the challenge? The signals of the biochemical tests are very good, unbeatable and very cheap also. So do that, wherever. But in the other way, the proteomics are very good. Then, genomics are very good. But genomics are very good. But NIPT, the proteomics test biochemical test has no competition with NIPT. Our NIPT and all the genetic tests that came in are only adding one level more. One uh, uh, genomic test, where I think one test in the market is not going to be test in the market. test in the market. If you want a convincing, if you want a white chromosome deletion, you can prove it. 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 Apa ah mutation guna gene, terutama orang berarti kita orang na protein, paling perlu protein boleh nak kerjai. Alangkah orang karya macam ni. For example, saya ni, saya have G6PD mutation. Apa anda Kerala kalian mutation orang ni, pinna kandu urus itu. Company orang ni guna orang ni, apa anda ni cie itu kandu dia macam ni. Doktor mana kandu dia macam ni lah. That, atau did not even know that G6PD deficiency, G6PD mutation ni ada problem with aspirin. Apa saya had to take aspirin. Apa aspirin kerjai orang ni, apa ini kita perlu main kerja sih orang. Tapi energi orang yang saya nak nuri pun tinggal itu. So it is like very difficult for me to live. Apa ni? Entah macam apa ni? Kerja ni, kerja ni, ni mai rendah kerja ni. Kita boleh ni kerja korup pun lah. Pasal ini kerja sentuh macam apa? Doktor kerja ni kerja macam apa? US le doktor, se India le doktor, se ada itu macam ni. Nobody will be say like, oh, ah aspirin kerja cukup, ini brand kerja cukup, ah brand aspirin. Banyak macam problem soal apa? Pasal si orang anemia aspirin itu kari macam tu. Benda tu, nama doktor se nari lah. Benda tu doktor se macam kari ni kari lah. Enda kardio doktor se ni udah US le doktor kari lah. Jadi, saya tapi 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 pala research di internet tu, Google tu, kalau tu, nama tu, mereka cepat tolpi kah macam tu. Why tu, why tu, okey pernah. Tapi, orang pada paper baru ini nanda, G6PD mutation orang ni kalau 1992 le paper ana, aspirin processing motion. Kalau aspirin orang ni kalau anemia anemia orang ni baru nalla chance ana, alor. Apa ni paper itu ni, saya ni ada doktor saya cuci tu pernah, awal orang zaman seri atau, sorry, nama kari leh tu, I mean, you know, adi am beri angan beri ni lah, so we didn't know. Apa, apa, apa ni? Saya buat cek test itu genetik ni kalau tu nayar tu ada yang macam tu. Walaupun recent kalau ni saya jisik speedy mutation ni kalau tu manusia kiri tu. Percaya jisik speedy mutation ini problem ada ni ni kari lah ni. Pilihan tu kalau jisik speedy mutation orang tenggelam, saya tu nak kena tu. Apa ni? Fundamental ada orang korupai lah. Apa? Ada ni dah nak kena tu? Orang kita protein test tu nak kau. Jisik speedy production ni 50 persen orang tu. Normal case. Kalau jangan aspirin kerja ada tu 20 persen ni tu baru. Apa ini? Apa ini? Semua nak kau tu. Apa? Yang kalau ni lab ni, ni blood tu tu. Saya ni experimental guinea pig lah. Kerja tu, ibu rasa tu, ki aspirin tu, oh korban tu, ni ngada ayam pukar tu. Apa proteomics tu? Itu protein sangat penting. Siapa proteomics actually will ada tu revolution macam tu. Jadi, apa amik tu in his talk might say briefly about proteins, because siapa sequencing technology, machines ni buat tu, they are able to do much better proteomics. Korang sama ni ada tu, ni dalam arti ni tu ni kau. Dah? Anymore? Ah, perlu. Ada itu satu textbook yang baca orang dalam. Ah, yang, share.
ഭയങ്കര ചോദ്യമാണ് ആരോ എഴുതി തന്ന പോലെ സംശയം എന്നെ എന്നെ ഒതുക്കാനായിട്ട് ആരോ എഴുതി തന്ന ഇവരോ എഴുതി തന്നാണോ അല്ലാതെ ഫാർമസി അല്ലേ ലോഡ് ഓഫ് തിങ്സ് ഞാൻ അവിടെ ടോൾഡ് ഏർലിയർ ടു ലൈക്ക് യുനോ ജിനോമിക്സ് ഇസ് ഡ്രിവൺ ബൈ യുനോ വി ഹാവ് ടു ഫൈൻഡ് ഔട്ട് ഓൾ ദ ഇന്റർലേഷൻ ഈവൻ മൈ ജി സിക്സ് പിടി എക്സാമ്പിൾ റൈറ്റ് ഫോർ എക്സാമ്പിൾ യു നീഡ് ടു ഫിഗർ ഔട്ട് ദ ദ കണക്ഷൻസ് ബിറ്റ്വീൻ ബിറ്റ്വീൻ മെഡിസിൻസ് ആൻഡ് ജീൻസ് വി നീഡ് ടു ഫിഗർ ഔട്ട് ആൻഡ് ഇൻ ദ ജീൻസ് ദ കൻ ബി സോ മെനി വേരിയൻസ് സോ വി നീഡ് ടു ഫൈൻഡ് ഔട്ട് ഗെറ്റ് ഓൾ ദ ഡേറ്റ so there is even talking to dr nawaz yesterday one of the critical things will be to build up enough clinical data so if you have a lot of clinical data then you can find, start associating a lot more and more right why is some people having a problem when you have that medicine if it's not a serious problem uh, you know but uh, so people uh, neglect it even clinicians are you no know, okay am i the medical chulu without really figuring out why that particular medicine is creating a problem uh, so so but we can actually start tracking that then if you have a good support lab for in the pharmacy pharmacology to nya nerthe parna cell lines ok undakkite you can then actually make it's not a very expensive experiment and all that you can make cell lines of uh, people cells and uh, and with the with the problem uh, uh, with the deficiency or with the genetic mutation and then you can uh, attempt putting the me- medicines in various dosages and then test the uh, uh, you know what is happening and there are a lot of uh, things that uh, that you can do research on but uh, basic you can use the current available knowledge of pharmacogenomics so there is already a well uh, established field called pharmacogenomics uh, where by a uh, uh, lot of new medicines are directly linked to uh, specific genetic mutations and and we also know that some medicines uh, should not be had if you have a specific mutation or the doses should be uh, controlled so so that is covered by the field of pharmacogenomics so pharmacogenomics may be the first step that you can start off on in the pharmacy side and develop the pharmacogenomics which is because existing knowledge is already there then identify maybe from our local screening or whatever some few genes of more interest to us like my case like you know because it, the d6pd kerala kalyan mutation is what i have here which is not uh, very common outside india that's why it's called kerala kalyan mutation because found in kerala and kalyan in west bengal so uh, so uh, like that so we can uh, focus on uh, specific things that are more of interest to us and then try to see the link between uh, uh, medical response uh, treatment response and the uh, patients uh, genome variation the genome data center also kerala genome data center also in the future uh, will be supporting many projects like that. okay thank you you want more no definitely dr nawaz the question my answer will even go on it then are when i was a student a long time back when i was a pdc student my teacher showed me a time magazine in front which shows that uh, watson and creek in their uh, cover story that was a, a coveted thing at those point of time time magazine was there and uh, she said uh, all those uh, discoveries were done in their, their mid 20s uh, james watson and francis creek were in the younger uh, I mean, in their uh, 20s, uh, not even 30, before they discovered the double helix structure of the uh, DNA. So that's when we heard about uh, this AGCT and all those things. Now in this room, we have a la- large number of uh, people who are in that age group. And uh, what uh, Sam Sandosh can do to instigate them to discover uh, the whatever is happening uh, in the Western world, to be the, the, the real discoverers uh, rather than copying what they are doing, uh uh doing uh, there or prescribing whatever they have done that what can be done uh, in association uh, yeah. or to uh, the ignite the spark in them to uh, the discover rather than to prescribe what is being discovered there yeah i think, I think very very uh, very good question uh, uh uh yeah we have to discover new uh, but uh, i would qualify that by saying we shouldn't be again be uh, rediscovering what has already been discovered so so in order to discover new first of all you have to quickly ramp up on and catch up on what has already been discovered right so that itself we are very behind so our first step should be to really ramp up very quickly and 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 come to par uh, with uh, with uh, whatever uh, uh, other people have already done 
So, frankly, uh, in most fields, we are about uh, 20 uh, years, 15 to 20 years behind. So, it's not a little catch up to do. Uh, so, the, and we can't do it in everywhere. So, like the lady said, okay, identify an area of interest. So, if we are go going to look at pharmacogenomics, okay, how can we quickly maybe catch up and uh, figure out everything that is now known about uh, uh, or discovered, already discovered in pharmacogenomics? And then try to see, uh, apply the uh, thing for our local needs. And then try to see, okay, how can we improve that and do more, which will be of value to us. And then we can add more to that. So that can be done practically in any areas of interest. So if you decide as a group, okay, uh, the, these are the areas. In gynecology, these are things that we are going to look at. Yeah, research, but in a very focused manner. Because otherwise... Tell me. Tell me. Tell me. Yeah, but ma'am, uh, that is a uh, that is the toughest part, right? Because the baby has already been born with the genetic disease. So, and the genetic uh, disease is like as of now, we don't have the technology to change the uh, gene mistake. I mean, we have the technology, but it has not been approved yet. So, the medicines can do little bit only because uh, because uh, uh, most of the development phase has passed, right? Uh, 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 so, so. Yeah, but uh, I'm not very competent to answer that. But uh, I think maybe later Manoj, Amit, uh, Ramchand, they all might be able to yeah. give a. Uh, I know it's a very serious and uh, I think uh, another lady also there really talked about it when we personally go through. Uh, uh, for me it was a minor g 6 d problem but even then I know what all problems I went through. So when you have a serious uh, uh, disease for a baby, uh, it, is a, it is a huge challenge. Uh, but, uh, but drugs have not been effective and the drugs that they are giving are all for, made for other things. So they are just trying to solve the symptom. They can only do that. I mean I'm not blaming them. They're the only the symptoms, how to alleviate the symptom they try to. Yeah, just the sort of, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Immobilize him so that he does yeah, that type of uh, experiment. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because, uh, and also, when you have these diseases, like uh, specifically developing a drug for a disease like that is also very difficult because, uh, uh, you know, uh, the process of a drug development is, uh, uh, is a very strict uh, methodology, right? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that, that can very well come in the future, you know, uh, but we will have to progress a lot. Currently, uh, you know, even to get an approval for a drug will take about, uh, average will be about 7 to 8 years. Most probably it takes about 10 years. So, 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 from, so, you know, for a, yeah, so that. Very difficult. Right? Sorry, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he was uh, working in LIC, so he his problem was that uh, suddenly he will start having a swelling of his lips, eyes, his cheeks, throat, and I have some photographs with me. This happened around six seven years back, and he suddenly started having this disease since past two months. So uh, and after some time, maybe three four hours, this will subside. And then he went to the skin specialist. Uh, what they suggested is he was having some uh, decayed teeth and some. Uh, root stumps in the old khaki. I'm a dental surgeon working in dental college. So the patient came to me as a reference from a dermatologist. So we extracted some broken teeth and did root canal for a, another tooth. Uh, thinking that this might be triggering that because usually some dermatological issues are triggered from the oral issues. But still the Thought patient didn't have any uh, 
So this person went to so many doctors and because he was my friend, I got the feedback. And then finally he went to Calicut Medical College where the medical depart medicine department uh, started studying him. And then finally... He didn't, go, he didn't go to any autoimmune uh, specialist? No. Must he went to a medicine department, Calicut Medical College. So they studied him and then finally what they found out is that he was on Telmesartan and then he had recently been promoted to a new office, uh, new post, uh, promotion in LIC. And the stress in his new chair was triggering this Telmesartan, uh, causing this disease, this condition in him frequently. So then they changed Telmesartan and uh, um, changed him to some other antihypertensive medicine and then he was fine. Oh. Mm-hmm. So that was the uh, thing which they found out after so much study so much on study, it. Yeah. So, so even it's a typical case of pharmacogenomics. Sir, so but I don't know whether the correlation with the chair... Uh, I mean stress in that new position. Because he was taking Telmesartan even before. But the promotion it took, took him to a new position in uh, the office. Yeah. So it that was some other also. Yeah. So the, uh, And my personal experience is I am also taking Telmesartan since some 10-12 years. So I feel that my... Uh, uh, the response and uh, temper uh, is like uh, has been changed after taking Telmisatan. So when you said about this aspirin story, I was thinking about my case. So I was thinking that seriously, sir. Yeah. <laughs> so I was thinking that should I like people like me or anybody X or Y, uh, the uh, physicians uh, they prescribe medicines. Even we prescribe medicine to our patients, antibiotics, uh, analgesics, antihistamines, steroids. So I think some uh, study should be there, like if there is any mutation or any genomic change in the uh, uh, stat, uh, to be done, yeah. very simple test to be done before you prescribe things like this, antihypertensive yeah. or anti-cancer drugs or um, anti-diabetic drugs, which are on long term we are taking. Yeah. So if there is some uh, 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 the extensive data will be needed. That is the only problem to uh, this. But if you are able to do large number of screening, screening medical colleges and hospitals like yours. And if you have a proper data, then from that we will be able to get insights like this. But the data collection will have to be done very thoroughly and, 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 and tracked properly. So if that is done, then it makes a, gives a good foundation for evaluating things like that. Yes. Absolutely, you are right in the sense that statins will create some problem on the other. Any of these medicines, I mean, they are affecting your uh, body. The band, as you take it longer and longer and longer, some problems will keep coming up. Then it is not just a genetics, it is epigenetics and it is uh, you know, many, many other factors that come so in. And even your microbiome. Before uh, prescribing the, uh, long-term medications, I think some study should be done by the physician before prescribing. If yeah, the pres- medicine is suitable for that person. Yeah. <laughs> even, yeah. But, uh, but physicians are doing treatment, right? So the study will have to be done by the research people or together. Mm-hmm. They can refer, yeah. <laughs> and then prescribe. Okay, thank you very much. Well, that was a very impactful session. Thank you, sir, for providing a vast knowledge on genomics and next generation sequencing technology. I guess most of us were unaware that next generation sequencing is the reason that led to the success of many companies in India. Now, I request Dr. Manoj Kumar, Principal, Kem City Dental College, to give a token of love to Mr. Santosh. So, Thank you, sir. Now, we have a short five minutes tea break. Tea and snacks have been arranged in the room opposite to this hall, requesting everyone to have a tea break and be back after five minutes. Thank you.
is a revolutionary uh, project uh, from KDISC. Uh, I've also mentioned about KDISC and the initiatives. Uh, so we are, what we are trying to do is, uh, we are trying to uh, create a data center very specifically uh, to harness the power of genomic data, which will be used for uh, researchers and creating an ecosystem of companies, uh, startups, uh, students, colleges, etc. And uh, Kerala has around 125 life science institutes where we are mapping and creating all the scientists uh, in one platform. And again, this idea started with uh, Sam Santosh uh, being part of uh, KDESC and then there has been a lot of deliberations on how we should do it in a proper manner with, with uh, uh, limited funds and other things. Um, so, yeah, that's why I'll just uh, briefly uh, tell you about uh, what has happened right now, where, we, where are we looking at for the next uh, five to ten years. So, we look at what are the benefits of uh, KGDC and Kerala's long-term mission, and I will uh, kind of summarize it with interconnectedness. Uh, how we as a species, currently we are on the top of the chain, but at the same time, we also need to look at uh, other species, including animals, plants, and we are part of this larger ecosystem of the environment. So if we don't protect uh, ourselves and other species, uh, we'll have a lot of pandemics coming up. So uh, KDISC is an innovation think tank from um, government of Kerala. It was started in the year 2021, uh, where Kerala being an economy is very different from uh, other places in India. Uh, the, the, because we have uh, tackled some of these problems some of the other Indian states uh, are facing. For example, uh, education, literacy, women empowerment. Um, so some of the states are still uh, kind of having many problems at the grassroots level. So we have kind of uh, migrated from there. At the same time, um, you know, uh, what is happening is uh, uh, the, when humans started evolving and then uh, we were initially hunter-gatherers, right, and then we were trying to get the food in, into the plates and kind of um, making uh, these initial uh, initiatives. So at the same time, uh, then came the largest revolution, which is agricultural revolution, wherein we started cultivating, so we had enough food, etc. And then the major shift happened uh, in industrial revolution, when we had factories coming up, so we were able to increase production uh, to mass level, so the prices comes down, so and after the World War II, and now we are in the uh, information revolution or knowledge revolution. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are in the mid middle of a bio wave. So how do we kind of capitalize on, uh, on these waves? Um, so one of the key initiatives from KDISC is uh, Kerala Knowledge Economy Mission. And the key objective is to create 2 million jobs uh, which are the knowledge economy. And uh, we have a very huge talent pool of people uh, who are trained. So uh, knowledge economy is something uh, where you are uh, use, using intellectual capa capacity to um, develop the economy. So typically we don't have uh, manual laborers much here, right? Because we are, uh, there are migrants coming from other states and working in Kerala. Uh, so how do we use the talent of our scientists, clinicians, researchers, etc., creating intangible assets like intellectual property, uh, creating patents, uh, which has a lot of value in the long run. So this is one program. KDISC has multiple programs, you can go to the website and see, but uh, for example, this Young Innovators program, uh, very interesting program, which is again, uh, you being an innovator, uh, you may have some ideas because uh, you are working in the grassroots, working with patients, etc. So you are seeing some problems, at the same time, you don't know where to go, how, to, how do you create a solution? Um, so Kerala government has this portal where you can go um, put an idea, and the based on your idea, merit of the idea, there's a committee which gets into that idea and try to understand whether it's something that we can pursue. Uh, they give some amount of money as funds uh, for you to pursue this idea. So that's called Young Innovators Program. It's in the uh, fourth season right now. Uh, so last week, uh, Honorable Chief Minister actually was giving the uh, awards for the finale, which happened in Kannur. Um, so again, you can go for the next uh, YIP, which should be happening in other, other nominations will start. So if there are some ideas that you have, uh, the government is always supportive to do this. Now, coming to uh, one of the core mission is skilling. Uh, people are skilled to do a particular level of job. So being in the medical arena, right? Uh, there are a couple of skill set which uh, everyone has to uh, be part. Uh, you need to develop that just to fulfill that job. At the same time, reskilling may also be needed because Say a doctor who has been working, we may undergo CMEs, etc., to learn more about the things. For example, genomics was something 
uh, which was not much uh, in demand in the last 20 years. But now everyone is talking about genomics uh, in medicine, um, say in dentistry, a lot, lot of arenas have opened up. At the same time, upskilling. And a lot of um, sciences have become interdisciplinary. We have experts from synthetic biology, um, again, chemistry, physics, etc., working together to create groundbreaking innovation. So uh, when I was doing medicine, I, I didn't have much of uh, an awareness about how this interdisciplinary uh, world works. But uh, fortunately, I've been working with a lot of uh, scientists from multiple fields in the last um, 10 years. And uh, we have seen a lot of innovation coming up. So again, skilling, reskilling, upskilling, and cross-skilling. Uh, because one problem that we see is, uh, as clinicians, a lot of times, uh, the problem that we see, but mostly we are, in the, we are in that phase of treating a patient, but how do you create innovation? How do you understand that problem? Uh, some of you may be already doing some research and publishing, uh, but how do you create a commercialized product, etc.? So Dr. Damson has been um, doing drug, drug discovery uh, and has created a lot of products. So, you know, he'll be talking about that. So there are three aspects of this. One is the knowledge creation part where we create centers of excellence creating postdoctoral fellowships, so the knowledge creation happens. So once knowledge is created, then comes a the knowledge dissemination phase where this created knowledge can be used to uh, make startups, uh, companies who can capitalize on this knowledge. Uh, so, so it will transform the traditional sectors into you know, knowledge economies and other uh, value-added services. And the last part is knowledge application. So building on top of this layer, we can create platforms where um, uh, people can uh, utilize the skill to earn a living or create uh, patents and other things. And um, so, so now we are at a stage where in previously India was considered as an outsourced outsource market. So for example, Bangalore and some of those companies who came up in Bangalore during the, you know, the entire boom, uh, IT boom, uh, most of the jobs were like outsourced to India, but now we can create companies here, we can scale it up, uh, go to the global economies. And we have a lot of mentors also here, a lot of access to funding, etc. Now, Kerala Genomic Data Center is a uh, is an endeavor, ambitious endeavor to create a high capacity data center capable of storing and processing large amounts of genomic data. And our vision is to produce and publish genomic data relevant to medicine, agriculture, veterinary, aquatic, um, and uh, and microbial genomics. Now, currently. Um, for the government, we are starting with uh, plant, animal, and microbial genomics right now. Uh, we are in the po policy formation stage right now. So human may come at a later stage, but the current approvals are mostly for uh, all the other sectors. Now, where is the uh, benefits coming up here? So typically, as I mentioned, uh, we have 125 life science institutes in Kerala. But uh, what has happened is these researchers are uh, you know, split working in silos. For example, Rajiv Gandhi. Uh, bioinformatics uh, place, which is in Trivandrum. A lot of research is happening there in cancer biology. But most of these researchers are not connected to other researchers. If, for example, someone in KMCT wants to uh, work on a particular cancer, and already someone is working on there, you can collaborate with them, create a different kind of research. A lot of data is already accessible. So uh, this platform will help that all the genomic data will come to a common data center, which will be uh, currently uh, will be done in, in Digital University Kerala, uh, uh, again revolutionary uh, digital uh, university which has been set up with, a, uh, with training people in blockchain, AI, ML technologies which is the need of the R. So we will have data distribution models, uh, quality control which will be done through scientists and uh, bioinformaticians, uh, storage of data and, genera and generate this data. For example, a lot of times when, you, when we sequence uh, the genomic data, uh, terabytes and petabytes of data created, but a lot of this data is noise. You need to analyze them to make it um, accessible, work on it. So, so we will also make sure that this data is cleaned up so that the right data comes to the platform. And we will also organize training and outreach activities where we will reach out to um, institutes, scientists, um, uh, again, colleges, etc., so that you can get trained in bioinformatics. Um, so we. Uh, Initiated one event in Trivandrum, which was conducted in March 14th, a uh, scientific seminar, a uh, one-day scientific seminar, where we had stalwarts coming from across the globe. Uh, we had some of uh, from some of the mavericks in the industry also joining online from US and uh, other Western countries also. So next set of events will also happen. We will let you know when this happens um, in, in Calicut. 
Now, who would be the key users of this data? One is hospitals and clinics because uh, you know all, all, all the genomic data currently, as I mentioned, is sitting in silos. So if that comes to one common platform, you can use bio tools to analyze it, use it uh, for your research and some of your analysis. Then comes research centers, uh, research institutes uh, which are working uh, in, in the genomic space. Universities and colleges. Uh, again, pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies uh, have huge value um, to this data. So they can also be part uh, and they, we are also expecting them to come and set up companies in Kerala um, for, for this. And again, startups and software companies are also, we are expecting them to come to Kerala and um, you know, utilize this uh, to create groundbreaking products. And the last part is policy makers and governments. So when a zoonotic infection happens, um, say Calicut witnessed a couple of zoonotic infections like Nipah which happened uh, a couple of years back. We saw the movie also. Um, uh, so, and we are also expecting more zoonosis to come. And uh, once you don't have a baseline data, we can't uh, understand how the mutations are going. So uh, once you have set up a baseline, uh, even if a new infection comes, you can actually upload the data. Uh, to the sender and find out what, what is the difference, what is the mutation coming up. And we can also immediately create antibodies. We, we have antibody libraries which has been create, created also. Um, some of our other speakers will be mentioning more on that. And coming to why Kerala, this is uh, one of such initiatives where a state government is building uh, this uh, genomic data center. Why? Because Kerala has a uh, huge biodiversi biodiversity. We are situated in a very unique position. Uh, I will also come to some of the uh, contiguous drift which happened. Uh, we have very different flora and fauna, which is only um, seen here. Um, and because of this, um, we need to preserve it. We, we have a lot of spice and cash crops. Some of our spices, in fact, the entire uh, colonization happened because people wanted our spices, right? And, and the flavor. This can be used to extract valuable uh, products, etc. Uh, we have a lot of cash crops, um, we have pepper, so all these things need to be sequenced and uh, uh, made available. Uh, and we have also unique uh, animal species, so with, with synthetic biology initiatives we can also meet a lot of um, better, better uh, veterinary products, etc. And as I mentioned, the flora and fauna of Western Guards. So if you look at how uh, our entire population evolved, you know, our uh, ancestry is derived from um, ancestors of South Indians who reached Malabar coast around 40,000 years back. And we have majorly 36 tribal groups which consist of around 3% of the total Kerala population. Uh, we have tribal groups in Palka, we have tribal groups in Vainad. Um, so there are a lot of studies which has been done. We have sickle cell anemia uh, which is also very uh, endemic in these regions. Uh, central government also has started a program on eradicating sickle cell anemia in the next 15 years. So there is a lot of uh, research which will be done and again a um, lot of research has been done. Dr. I.C. Verma who is one of the pioneers in this field, uh, he is also one of our advisors. Uh, he has been studying this from 2004, he's called, uh, he's a clinical genomics uh, father for, for the Indian population. At the same time, a um, lot of things are not available uh, in, a, in a common database. So that's where we can uh, do a lot of things through this. And on the biodiversity, we actually come in the hinge point between Indian subcontinent in Madagascar. So there is a big drift which happened, which happened around 100 million years ago. So we have very specific um, uh, animals like the Vetchur cow, Chervali cattle, Atapadi goat, etc., the purple frog. Uh, so uh, this is kind of very exciting for scientists and our um, uh, people working in this field. Now, what we'll be doing? So the biosecurity initiatives, as I mentioned, right? Because One Health is also attaining um, huge uh, impetus at this current point. So currently, we don't, we are not going to do human initially, but we also have uh, approvals to do curate, uh, curated human data, which has been already published in the um, in the public domain. So we will be initially doing sequencing of uh, plants, which are um, important to Kerala's economy, or microbes um, or, or other um, animal species which are either important to Kerala or economically uh, good for Kerala. So we will uh, do reference genomic data, transcriptomic data, etc. Identify key genes and markers associated with important phenotypic trait. Uh, also, we'll also look at virulence, uh, understanding and antimicrobial resistance. So I think for people working in microbiology, doctors, uh, we give a lot of antibiotics every day. 
and uh, we we sometimes feel why it's not working, right? Because there has been mutations which has happened. So the antimicrobial resistance is something that uh, is of a concern. We are not also getting new uh, products in antibiotics, so we are facing a huge problem there. Um, yeah, I've been part of some of those discussions where the Chennai declaration happened, where uh, judicious use of antibiotics are also on top priority. So if you have a data bank uh, or, a, or a, a data center, we can actually understand what is going wrong or in fact we can also uh, develop new products based on the research. Now the key objectives would be, one will be we'll be setting up a required IT platform which includes hard, hardware and software for analysis, uh, storage, distribution of data. And again, um, not only the hardware, we also require um, the right software because typically for doing bioinformatics uh, we require pipeline uh, or the reference genomic data where we actually try to match after the sequencing is done. So this requires um, specific training for the staff who's handling it, um, specific software. So uh, typically some of, for example, Qsat um, has installed uh, the Illumina sequencing machines uh, but they may not have all the pipelines in place. So once you have a common center, the government can actually invest uh, in this infrastructure so that everyone can use it. So all the colleges in Ke uh, Kerala can use it. In fact, we can also give access to other colleges also who are interested, who wants to be part of the consortium. Then develop and become a storehouse of important genomic data variable to Kerala. And again, train manpower who can become, uh, you know, very work on this high throughput data analysis. And the last part is a larger vision would be to collaborate uh, invite industry associations uh, and entrepreneurial um, bodies to partner. For example, ABLE is a bio, bio cluster which is based in Bangalore and I'm also seeing Indian Angel Network uh, which is also trying to create a bio angel uh, uh, network. So they're trying to bring in clusters. So typically the Boston ecosystem where uh, Manoj comes from, uh, there are universities who are doing research at the same time industry and the VC uh, ecosystem. These three partners should come together so that we can we can get these innovations commercialized because in biology the problem is it's a long cycle. To develop a new drug will take billions of dollars, uh, 10 years of wait to get the right drug, the right kind of product. So some of the Indian ecosystem is not yet mature enough to handle this long cycle. We have Flipkarts and PhonePay. Uh, these companies are unicorns, but at the same time, um, you can easily start seeing the result once you can scale up faster, uh, doing discounts, etc. So, uh, since we are passionate about healthcare uh, and bioinformatics, uh, these partnerships will help. And bringing together all the life sciences institutes in just one single umbrella under a single platform. And uh, we already have a really good manpower. For example, Kerala University has been having a bioinformatics department uh, for a long period of time under Dr. Achit Shangar. Um, they have been doing groundbreaking work. They have sequenced some of the Kerala's very unique plants, etc. But at the same time, after this war, so we will also offer these students um, rescaling opportunities, cross-scaling opportunities, etc. Now, this is schematic representation of how this data center will look like. Uh, we will have this high throughput instruments like the Illumina sequences, sequences etc. From here, the data will be coming to a tier one storage system, which will be managed by NVIDIA GPUs. So how it works is typically our computers can do calculations, but the genomic data will require um, quadri million calculations, etc. So uh, these are very um, HPCs. And again, this will help to do this calculations faster and you can reach the conclusions faster also. And again, it will require a uh, different set of storage conditions. You require very specific uh, temperatures, a lot of, lot of set guidelines so that the run can happen in time. I was part of a couple of these trainings uh, last month uh, at QZAC. Uh, again, from there, we have a tier two storage and then a, um, a clusters, etc. So on one hand here, uh, you have these local researchers, which includes uh, scientists and students here at multiple locations in Kerala. So from them, they can upload these data into uh, the storage center and anyone can access it. So typically we want to create a controlled access wherein uh, you're uploading the data, but Again, um, you know, not everyone can access the data unless they're part of the consortium, etc. And everyone in Kerala, for example, government can access data. So if there is an IPA outbreak happening here, if Calicut Medical College uploads that data, so a researcher who's based in Toronto can look at it, maybe suggest a solution. So that way it becomes very comprehensive. Things happen faster. During COVID, uh, there are a lot of these common platforms which were created. 
Um, so that was also looking at the mutations and the sequencing part. And that was helping people to come up with um, newer modalities of treatment. So the benefits would be uh, the Life Science Institute, right? So I'll just, uh, so oh, the trigraphs are not working, but uh, 125 institutes, and uh, this is ranging from Castle Gota to Vandrum. Um, so uh, the key beneficiary would be the Kerala government, Life Science Institutes, uh, industry, body and startups and research institutes. Now, what will we do with it? One is improve healthcare outcomes. Uh, we can look at early markers of disease uh, within a certain population group, which would enable early diagnosis and significantly increase the chances of successful treatment. Uh, then would be skill upgradation. Uh, so we can skill at least 1,000 people in bioinformatics and data analysis, uh, again, directly facilitating third-party providers to use the data center. We are hoping to create um, jobs, high-paying jobs in Kerala with this initiative. It's also a mission by uh, Knowledge Economy Mission. So, uh, for example, we are also investing in Bio360 Park, Digital Science Park, etc. So we'll also have a lot of companies coming up, setting up uh, their own ventures inside these centers where they can absorb these people and um, you know give them jobs. And the last is a research platform where we will link um, all these institutes together. Now coming to the sickle cell anemia part which I briefly mentioned. Um, this is again a part of central government program. Uh, so we will also uh, use this platform to kind of understand the, understanding the disease how sickle cell anemia works and the clinical manifestations are also very different. So we can sequence the data uh, and understand for early detection and screening. And again, uh, the world is moving towards personalized medicine, especially in many conditions. For example, in, in oncology, for example, in breast cancer, there are at least 12 to 20 different lines of treatment depending on your um, you know, genomic analysis. So some drugs may not work in, in, in some patients. So if you understand that early, you'll be able to pinpoint the right treatment to the patient, so the patient responds. And the last would be research and development. Uh, we can also stimulate a lot of research into new treatments and therapies for the sick. Yeah. Now, this is something very interesting because uh, Kerala has a huge forest cover, which is ranging from Kasago to uh, Trivandrum. And every district has some kind of a forest cover. So, what's the significance here? What, will be, what is happening is there's a crossover of infections between humans to animals and um, you know, other, other vector-borne diseases, etc. So, for example, Nipah outbreak happened. Um, the, the greatest pandemic that we, have, we all have been part of, uh, it happened. it's also a zoonotic disease, right? So, there is all, the, all these things are happening. At the same time, how can we mitigate uh, you know, the next pandemic? So, for this, we require surveillance data. So, biosecurity is one of the core elements. Uh, Government of Kerala has a One Health initiative, uh, again, which is uh, led by Toronto Medical College's uh, Infectious Disease uh, Department. So they have been doing a lot of work. They have been doing a surveillance at Pamba region. So they are looking at a lot of um, these initiatives. At the same time, um, many, many of us may not have access to the data. So we, we can use this platform to, uh, again, kind of look at surveillance. We can also upload our data, what is happening in Calicut region, um, Malabar region, etc. Uh, and again, these animals are also getting some of our diseases, as I have mentioned, like TB is also seen in elephants, etc. Uh, so the One Health Biosecurity Initiatives will also uh, gain immensely from KGTC. Now the long-term vision would be how we are envisaging how this uh, will become a huge boon to a um, lot of things. One is the training and education part. We are also looking at a consulting services model wherein uh, KGDC will act as an anchor wherein companies can come and provide consulting services to other, other companies. Uh, large scale data sets will be used for creating value added set solutions and KGDC uh, can act as a consulting services provider where they can um, you know, help them. We can also look at partnerships and collaborations with uh, startups, uh, big con conglomerates like Google or any, any of those companies. We are also expecting grants and funding to come. After the initial investment of around 500 CR, uh, we are expecting we can also um, get grants from um, similar uh, organizations working in the space. We can also have data licensing uh, opportunities where uh, we, we can um, help to uh, monetize uh, these services. And comes data analysis and interpretation services. And again, customized data curation management. We will also create our own software 
uh, for managing some of these uh, key data elements. And we also will have a lot of pipelines uh, and uh, digital arrays. So this clearly aligns with the knowledge economy missions um, uh, guidelines, which is again knowledge creation, knowledge dissemination, and again the platform model of applications development. Now I want to bring in this concept of data as a public good. So we have a very good model here uh, where UPI was created. So UPI is the Unified Payment inter Interface. So what has happened is, uh, look, um, 10 years before, uh, there was no peer-to-peer -peer transfer system of uh, money. So what happens is you have money in your account, but you just need, for what if you, you are using an auto rickshaw and he needs 22 rupees. So you have to actually physically give cash and they, they have to give cash back. But now what happens is everything happens over your phone. Uh, so things which have happened is, um, again, the, the data cost came down. That is one. Second is we have smartphones. Third is because of the system, which was again done by the government. And again, startups came and started building on top of it. So data is a public good. That's what we are envisaging. Um, so government can act as a provider, act as an enabler, as a lab, as a, as a smart system. So what happens is, due to this, there is a lot of transparency in the system. It becomes easy for other startups and other companies. So the co-creation happens. And again, for some of the parameters, government can also regulate some of these key aspects. So, uh, so if you go to any UP, it's very easy to set up. You just need a phone number to start. You need an email ID to start with. And uh, so, so similarly, we will also envisaging um, that this data center will become like a, a, a huge change wherein any company working in bioinformatics or uh, this space, especially plant, animal, microbial, um, uh, can utilize this. So one key element that we found during this course of journey was that um, aquatic health. Uh, there are a lot of good institutes working. The KUFOS is one institute in uh, Cochin, National Institute of Aquatic Health, again in Cochin. So they are doing so much of work, uh, and Kerala being a state where there's a lot of fish, con fish consumption. If, if, a, if something happens, uh, any, any pathogen attack happens, that literally will wipe out some of these organisms. And it, it can also create problems, uh, you know, some kind of diseases in humans. So that's where it is. And again, we're also looking at uh, genomics data would become a crucial asset and part of infrastructure, and it can massively transform Kerala into a knowledge society. Uh, so we will also be uh, taking some funds from KIFB and some, uh, some grants from Kerala government, and we would be happy to uh, partner with uh, your, your institutes, etc., uh, from, from anything related to research and development. Thanks for patient listening. If there are any questions, I can uh, take it up. Thank you. Is there any queries from the audience side? So what was DWMS on the platform you mentioned? DWMS? Oh, it's a government platform which is created so that whatever scaling is happening, uh, the government has created that platform. So where someone can register, uh, they're looking for a job. At the same time, government will also partner with companies who need those skill set. For example, it can be an entry-level IT job. So government partners with some companies in InfoPath. They understand from the company what is the skill set needed to perform that job. So they are just making a match between these two partners. So that platform is called DDFS. Uh, yeah. Someone at the back. Uh, so, uh, interestingly, uh, during our curriculum, there's not much of awareness about <coughs> bioinformatics, but we need good uh, people who uh, understand both medicine and uh, bioinformatics. Uh, one good example is Dr. Vinod Skaria. I, I yes. know, I know. Yeah, right. So, he got trained in bioinformatics, but we are seeing, pro so we definitely will create curriculum where uh, we, we want to create that also. So, that will also be explored uh, in the due course of time, but I'm seeing that 
there can be initiatives by the central government also where they are also putting in genomic education as part of one of the the new mbbs curriculum will also have some part of genomics we are seeing dm um, medical genetics coming into picture some of my friends are doing it right now and also if there is any certificate courses or something like that for already finished uh, for people yeah there is one uh, program by sanofi genzyme uh, so it's a company working in the orphan diseases as you mentioned so they have a grant and uh, they work with couple of uh, big institutes in india one is nizams uh, one is scpgi so they have three four partners you can apply if you have but they have some caveat which is you should have an md in uh, pediatrics there are some fees they have identified but you can apply to those institutes and it's a short program like three months less than three months program where you get to know the basics and other things i i can let you know uh, how it is like thank you anyone else yeah thank you uh, we'll go to the next speaker thank you sir it give our attention to the areas we have been unaware of Now I request Dr. Sathi P P, Professor and Head, Department of Pathology, Kane City Medical College, to deliver a token of gratitude to our speaker. once in a while a new technology an old problem and a big idea turn into an innovation manoj krishnan obtained his phd from kerala in biophysics and completed his post doctoral training at yale university in genetic regulation of human immune response subsequently he worked at the duke ns medical school singapore as a faculty member he also worked at the mammalian pharma foundry focusing on developing gene and cell therapy approaches using synthetic biology currently dr krishnan is working at manus bio as head of pharma focusing on developing novel bio manufacturing platforms for unmet drug modalities sir we welcome you for the session sorry um i'll i'll just begin by uh, saying my thank you to the leadership of kmtc and uh, saijino for and asalas for to all of you for giving me this wonderful day and a reason to travel to kalikat after 29 years things change a lot i see too many buildings big buildings um uh, today i will talk a bit about a bird's eye view on how synthetic biology a as a field is going to help us solve a lot of the problems that we are facing or we're going to face in the coming decades or in the next century. And fortunately, I don't have to speak a lot. Sam has really covered a lot of things that I wanted to talk, so that made my job uh, by half. If you look at the, or the sentences, I, I, I choose, chose uh, multiple intentional spelling mistakes. So what does synthetic biology do? That's what we do, right? take biology and rewrite the language and make it do something so it's, it's that simple make spelling mistakes so it will produce something that we want that's all about synthetic biology um, now i will begin by taking one sentence that sam made sam said you know, homo sapiens has solved all the problems that the early humans had and i completely agree with that but i want to add on to that saying that now we ha we have become the problem Uh, too many of us here so we grew in numbers over time let's take a deeper look 10000 years ago my family was very small but under 4 million or something as we reached 14 15 16 17 century we increased 
so high on the number that we attain a critical minimum density, then boom, next thing you see is that. We just grew so high in number that we are everywhere on the earth, right? And how did that happen? Uh, it's very simple. As the time passed by, we became more aware of how to take care of our, ourselves. We learned about diseases. We learned how to extend our life span. We also learned how to protect us from natural cause of death. So that's one way we increase our numbers. And second thing, we also want a lot of staff to survive, to eat uh, our commodities that we need to survive as a team or as an individual. So we developed industrial processes for meeting our uh, commodity needs. As Sam said, we went through four cycles of industrialization, from first to third wave, using different sources of energy and, and information. Now we are at the fourth wave of industrialization, right? So far, so good. We grew in numbers, which means we are stronger than 10,000 years ago. But what's the uh, flip side of that number increase? So in the beginning, everything was sufficient when we were fewer in number. But what happened? Uh, as the number increased, uh, something else did not increase proportionately. Uh, we are standing on a, a globe, right? The surface area did not increase. The content that this surface holds did not increase, which means as we grew in numbers, the resources that we need to survive did not increase. For example, we were very good at depleting forests. Uh, we realigned the prehistoric uh, geography of the earth uh, because we want to increase so much in numbers, so many in numbers, we want to have more buildings. Uh, we didn't know the consequence of destroying things for our benefit. We did all those things. So now we are at a point where uh, the resources that we need to survive at this high number is not really matching up the way we want. And not just to take the case of food, to eat the food, uh, you know, we have two kinds of food, right? One is the uh, animal food uh, using the grasslands, and then the crops that we grow to eat from the crop plant. Uh, as you can see here, the last uh, 200 years, we sort of maxed out what the earth can offer for farming. Either agricultural farming or, or the veterinary farming. Now, the prediction is that it's going to come down uh, severely by the end of, or before the end of the century, which means our number is not, not going to go down, but the support system we need is going to go down. So we have a problem now. We need more ways to produce what we need. So question is, how do we do it? In today's talk, I want to emphasize on this emerging or maturing field of synthetic biology, how is that going to help us manufacture various things that we need as we are growing these gigantic numbers. So what's wrong with today's manufacturing uh, processes? As you can see here, I intentionally am showing the globe as a lightly pink red color to show that it's not in a good shape. So right now we make things, whatever it is, by using a protocol by which we're depleting the resources. So in history, we were rich in resources, now we are going towards nothingness, if that's a word, right? What are we taking from the earth? We are not refilling it. So it's a one-way trip, which means we can't go too far. That's one of the problems that, that our current manufacturing technologies have. Second thing is health impact agnostic. Uh, we kind of pollute. We don't care the downstream consequence, good or bad to our society. We don't really care. Third thing is, you all know that it's too warm now compared to 40 years ago. We are so carbon positive. Even when I'm talking, this is probably coming from some coal plant or something, I'm adding the greenhouse effect. So we don't want that, we now know the consequence. And the fourth problem is that we are now following a centralized manufacturing. Something is made somewhere in Guangzhou in China, then there is a war coming, nothing has shipped to India. So we are supply chain vulnerable right now, right? So we want to have a solution that takes into account all these five problems. Now, what should that solution be? We all went through three industrialization uh, revolutions. We explored all the options that we could think of. Now, what is the solution? The solution would be to look in the mirror, right? If I look in the mirror, what do I see? I see myself. So who am I? I'm life. So if I break myself down, what do I see? Cells. What are cells to do? Every second they are producing something, manufacturing something. So then the question is, 
why can't we use ourselves as factories? So that's the birth of uh, biomanufacturing, so a solution that can give us a more sustainable, renewable, non depletable way of producing things in an extremely environmental friendly way. So to go in a philosophical way, the only self-renewing, non depletable resource on Earth is life itself. Right? We can kill life. Uh, if we provide the right environment, it's going to perpetuate by itself forever. It can duplicate, once it duplicates, whatever, but it's never going to get depleted. Now, if you want to use life as a manufacturing uh, factory, then the question is, why do you think life is capable of doing that? It's simply because nature already tested on life for 3.7 billion years, and it perfected uh, life as a source of manufacturing. So we don't even need to reinvent anything here. We just have to learn to use it. So that's where the thought on can we use biology to manufacture, uh, to meet our growing commodity needs. And that's the birth of synthetic biology. Now, are we a bunch of scientists dreaming on this? No. Like you can see here, some of the best economic uh, institutions have really evaluated and projected that Biomanufacturing is going to be there in place to meet the growing needs of human society on a declining landscape. Now, are we the first people to think about this? What happened in history? Did anyone use biomanufacturing? We all eat yogurt rice, so too bad that my slide does not have yogurt written there. I put something else. Um, so yogurt, which we all take, it's, I don't know how many thousand years humans have been making yogurt. We already have been doing manufacturing very successfully in a very sustainable, eco-friendly way. Likewise, wine, cheese, all those are done via biomanufacturing. But that's during a time where we didn't know what we're doing from a reasoning perspective. We had certain methods that worked without knowing how it works. Right? As the time progressed, we discovered uh, antibiotic penicillin, came from microbe. So we knew that if we grew this particular microbe, we could make a lot of antibiotic. Time passed. Over the next, uh, what, 40 years, we could use bacteria or fungi or some microbes to make some enzymes we need for industrial purpose. In all those cases, we didn't do any engineering because we didn't know much about what's inside the microbe or cell. We were just growing them at scale and then just collecting what it produces that are of interest to us. Then, as shown in this highlighted book, an era came where, as Sam said, we began learning a lot more about what happened within a cell. What are the tools, what are the parts, what are the rules those cells and its components use to function itself as a life. Once we came to know those source codes, we got the ability to uh, tame the cell, the life, to make it fit exactly what we wanted to produce. So that's where the synthetic biology as an organized science comes into play. Now, what else in the biology would uh, need or achieve to convert life as something useful for us to produce something? Uh, it's very simple. We are all made of cells. So either cell itself is alive, or a collection of cells become alive, right? Unicellular versus multicellular. So what the biology aims to do is simply, can we convert this cell as commercial factories? Very simple, like smart cell factories, like smartphones. And then we grow them at scale, like in a ferment version. Uh, so if you think about that, it's very simple. Take a bunch of cells, put what, make, record it to make what we want it to make, then grow it at scale. That's synthetic biology. Um, at a high level, you take a cell, do something to that, make it function the way you want to function, grow them in big reactors, then make whatever you want. Could be cheese, could be, I don't know, some uh, cosmetic products. Uh, medicine, insect repellent. So it's, it's that simple conceptually. We go further down, how does that happen? We have mammalian cells, bacterial, fungi, a range of cells, right? In theory, any of those can be converted as cell factory, smart cell factory. All those cells need is one thing energy source. And we need to put, uh, doesn't have to be sugar, I just put sugar there. And then we need to put some kind of information, which is the DNA, depending on the context, carrying some information that this cell should use to make something that we want it to make. And then it grows in large quantity, 
and then here comes what we want, what our product we want. Now, how is this done experimentally? Uh, this is a very simple concept, right? Now, if you zoom in further, how does that happen oh, from a technology point of view? Say, for example, um, a lot of us know that many other perfumes have citric smell, right? Uh, citrus smell. And if you look more carefully, the strong citrus smell, moderate, mild, and different, different shapes of citrus smell, uh, they're all a family of molecules with different kind of, kind of chemical properties. If I want to create a range of citrus smell producing molecules, what I would do is I would try to create a, a parental universal cell that has a bunch of molecules, uh, precursor molecules enriched that can be quickly converted to this molecule, that citrus molecule, this citrus molecule, etc. Once I create that parental strain by a lot of metabolic engineering, then I will re-engineer that cell to make only the particular molecule I wanted to make through metabolic engineering, where we can change the flow of the uh, carbon source, which is the, uh, the template that becomes a product, and energy, which is what it uses to do that process, and then enzymes who are the work force who test the chemistry to make the molecule. And lastly, once you do all these changes, the cell still has to be able to handle what we are asking it to produce. So we need to do a, a holistic re-optimization on, on, on how the cell would function as a factory. Once we do all those things, we can make customized individual cell uh, platform or chassis or factory. Each one can make one molecule of interest to us, whatever it is. In this case, I have listed a lot of things, right? You can create cells that could make a food. And in food itself, there are many types of food. So that's how it's done at, at a much more detail, but still at a conceptual level. Now, if we go within the cell level, how do we do this? Some already said that we learned to uh, read the language of the cell which is DNA, and then also edit it, rewrite it. So if you want to do a metabolic engineering, all we have to do is understand this language, remove or add what we wanted to do, we turn off, turn on, what we want to be turned on, turned off. It's very simple. Now, looking backward. But then we have a problem, right? Once we do metabolic engineering, the actual job is done by enzymes. Uh, we may have to create new enzymes. We may have to improve the performance of existing enzymes. How do we do that? So, you know, over the last 60 or 70 years, we learned many ways to understand how enzymes function. Now, with the development of uh, software applications, uh, we are able to model how different proteins behave. We could introduce a mutation and see how that changes the structure, and we can predict most likely what will be the outcome. And then we now, you know, the last three or four years, we have machine language uh, enabling us a lot. And not only that, we have the technology to now understand protein, visualize how it should change. After do all those things, we need to test them on the ground. And, and identify a design that performs best. All the time, it may be one experiment a month, now it may be a million experiments a month at scale. So we have come a long way, right? So we can now do all this enzyme engineering rapidly. So that's the way it works. Now, what all things can we make using Symbio? Uh, as I you know, brought here, just like in a half a century or something, we won't have enough um, uh, platforms to make uh, what we want using traditional manufacturing. Uh, so then what all things can we make using synthetic biology? Think of what happens when I wake up in the morning, right? I get out of my bed, I would love to have a coffee with the milk. There's an egg on my side, I'm so happy. There's one slice of cheese, I'm totally in bliss. So I need some different kinds of food. So I finish my breakfast, then I take a shower, I get change to my, the thought I like. I don't like maybe cotton because it wrinkles a lot. I like something that's wrinkle free. So I gotta think about what kind of material I have to use to make the cloth that I want to wear. As I dress and walk, I see a perfume bottle sitting on the shelf. Why not, why don't I spray it, right? Oh, in between I realize that I have to take, sorry. In between I realize I have to take some medicines. Uh, so that's my morning routine. In fact, Sinbaya can make all those things food and beverage, items from beauty and wellness, consumer products, and sustainable materials, and pharma and biotech. So essentially, Symbio has the ability to 
make a wide range of things that we need in our everyday life. Maybe not metal and mineral formations like rock, uh, etc. Now, you all probably know by now, right, that you have lab-grown meat. Um, Cow-free milk is there around the corner, and the chicken-free egg is around the corner. Uh, so, Sinbai is going in violent directions now. I'm going to give two examples on what my company is doing in the health and wellness segment to use Sinbio to produce certain commercially important uh, products, one a drug and one a wellness uh, product. Um, I'll take since two slides to set some background on this. Uh, and I, I want to share on how Symbio can enable manufacturing of medicines and wellness products. And you know, as clinicians or people in that field, you know that all the human drugs can be largely uh, put into six bins, right? going from small molecules all the way to living productivities, including vaccines and, and microbiomes. Uh, if you look carefully, many of these are made historically using different procedures. As you will see in this slide, all in times we were extracting medicines, right? Uh, even now, I think more than 30% of our medicines are extracted as a starting step. It might be purified eventually. Then in 1950s onwards, we developed synthetic biology where we could make chemicals in the lab small molecules in the lab. Then in the 70s, we started um, genomic genetic engineering that helped us to build the early versions of uh, biologics that could be made by cell. And we passed to 2000s. We scaled up this whole genome tinkering process. Now we could understand the language of the genes, change the gene, make different molecules. We can also now change the whole cell in many ways that we wanted to function. So, as you can see here, uh, there are many different angles where Synbio can get in to uh, help us make any one of these class of drugs. I haven't call out one example uh, that we did in our company uh, to use Synbio to meet a, a pharmaceutical need. You all know that atimacinin is a uh, historically most successful anti-malarial drug, and it's currently procured from China uh, from a plant. Uh, the problem with that supply chain is that uh, it's highly it's by its availability is highly variable uh, if weather is bad activism price goes up and the patients are primarily in sub-saharan africa they are so economically uh, deprived they can't afford unless agencies fund subsidize uh, two farmers might change their preference every year this year they might decide i only want vanilla farming not activism farming farm. then supply is broken um, or if there is any supply chain issues like war. So the end result is that there is price instability and, and supply chain variability. And Bill Gates Foundation decided that this monopoly and this uh, dependence on this farming source has to be abandoned. So they approached Manus asking if we could use synthetic biology to create uh, atomism in the lab, in bacteria. So that's how this project began four and a half years ago. Um, so what they asked us was, instead of depending on this plant in China, can you make activism in, in the lab using bacteria? Um, several years ago, one lab, so what is shown here is the activism in uh, biosynthetic pathway by this plant in China. It uses a precursor, goes through a series of chemical reactions by enzymes, ending up in making activism in. Uh, a research group many, many years ago has engineered yeast to make this, this precursor atimacinic acid in yeast, but it's still far away from the end product. Plus yeast based from manufacturing is not very uh, uh, economically uh, beneficial. It takes longer to grow, it, the yields are not great. We thought, what if we uh, use bacteria instead of yeast? Could we force that bacteria to make atimacinin? Uh, could we take all the enzymes from this plant, put them in the bacteria, or come up with our own enzyme designs and, and engineer the bacteria to make uh, atimacinin. Or if we can get bacteria to make atimacinin, could we go further than this precursor, get closer to this the immediate precursor, DHAA, dihydroatimacinic acid? Um, with our information, uh, bio computational biology team found out that uh, no one knows how the plant converts DHAA to atimacinin. Uh, we now even think that it's done by sunlight, not even enzymatic. Uh, so then we redefine our goal to get the bacteria to make 
DHAA, the last precursor before the final drug. Uh, so what we did was we cleared any bacteria with a precursor called farnesin uh, as the precursor that is in high abundance. Then we put a series of enzymes, went through many rounds of enzyme engineering, um, bacterial engineering, finally ended up in making a strain first that can make a ton of this precursor. So that gave us confidence that bacteria can handle this chemistry. Uh, then we went back to gas foundation if we need more money. So we went to phase two, spent another two years, we could convert this into this precursor. Uh, essentially, we ended up in uh, creating an E. coli system that could make the last precursor of actinocin pathway. The beauty here is that E. coli is pretty friendly and inexpensive to grow. They divide in 20 minutes. Maybe in a day and a half, the whole manufacturing can be done. And we got, I think it's four times higher yield than what is known in literature. So you now we are at a condition where uh, we could make this professor in, in nearly kilogram scale. Now all we need is purify it and then do a, uh, a photochemistry using light, convert that into the final molecule. So in a way we can control the uh, dependence on the farming sources for getting oxygen in. Uh, as you can see here, you know, we just got three months ago, certain amount produced at, and in a scale of fermentation. That's one example on how synthetic biology can, can uh, help us to not depend on nature, uh, not to harm nature. The second example um, I'm going to be talking today is on how our company is trying to help us uh, manufacture natural products that are used as wellness products. We all know that we use uh, what Tulsi, uh, Brimmy, etc for different purposes, right? And, and that's a historical, um, uh, cultural thing too, right? They all have certain kind of properties, and uh, to the least, they're all anti-inflammatory, let's put it that way. Um, you can see that in all cultures use wellness products, uh, not only Indian, uh, Chinese, African, and Latin American. Uh, I don't know about Middle East, is, they have less plants, unfortunately, but they have their own systems too. And, and now with all this uh, health awareness, sustainability awareness uh, and, and reluctance to use synthetic products, people are switching to use natural products on a daily basis now, or wellness products. So we have, you know, the, but then the plant resources are declining and also because the climate is changing, a brandy that was produced 20 years ago is now, is different from what is being produced today from the same soil, right? So what's the solution here? Can we get back to, the, to, do, to do the job? Uh, if we can make lab-made uh, milk, meat, egg, why not all the natural products from the lab? Um, but now, if, uh, you can see here, there are many classes of natural products used in different cultures. Uh, we zoomed in on ginseng, which is primarily Korean, uh, parts of Chinese origin, uh, Southeast Asian uh, wellness products, which is now getting global uh, traction at high, uh, is in high demand across different cultures now. We thought, what if we try to uh, create uh, ginseng or its components in the lab? And it's called the root of immortality, uh, right? Um, its market is growing really you know, heavily. And so what, what is it that ginseng made of? Uh, there's a bunch of sugars and proteins and lipids. But the actual components are around 100 plus molecules called ginsenosides. They're like terpenoid compounds. So we thought, why do we make them in the lab? We focused on these five or six, they, uh, which are present in high abundance in, in ginseng. Uh, what we did was, um, oh, before that, one of them called RG3 is well known to promote hair follicle growth, and I'm, I need that. So it's my own personal need that has to be made in the lab before I become bald. So, uh, you know, you can see there are two different kinds of dinsenosides, uh, PPD type, it's an abbreviation of a chemical structure, and PPT type. So we thought, what if we force uh, the cell to play around some of the precursor molecules, the primary cell, put some enzymes and drive it in different directions. Uh, it only took two and a half months that we were lucky, we could make multiple uh, ginsenosides, including RG3. So now we know that we could potentially recreate 
the actual ginseng that we extract from the ginseng plant in the lab, which is some kind of formulation by Ramjan. Uh, so that's the beauty of um, the technology. Now, that's all I wanted to share today, but then what can Kerala do in this space? Uh, between Raju and Sam, a lot have been covered, and I want to give a different angle to this, right? We have our own spices. Why did India become a colony? Because of our spices. We are at fault now, right? Uh, so, but someone else could one, one day or soon make all our spices on the lab, maybe in China. What if we do that before they do, right? Could we make our spices in our lab? Uh, our medicinal plants, coconuts, moon tea, coffee. I don't think it's too far before we make this in the lab. I know some labs are all doing these things. Uh, that's all, and thank you. Uh, Thank you, sir. Is there any questions from the audience side? Thank you, sir. All right. <coughs> So please say that. Uh, mm, it was, thank you, sir. It was thought provoking. We are thankful for you to choose to bring this to our awareness. Now I request Dr. Dinesh Kumar, Professor, Department of Druva Yuga, KMCT Ayurveda, to hand over a memento of talking. Thank you, sir. Before we move to the next session, we have a lunch break. Lunch have been arranged outside this hall. Next, we have Dr. Amit Chaudhary. He is a highly experienced professional in drug discovery and technology advancement. Amit Chaudhary has a PhD in biochemistry and did his postdoctoral research at Harvard Medical School and Medical University. Yeah. Currently, he serves as the head of research at Phi Genome, collaborating with IT companies to create products with potential benefits for cancer patients. With an impressive career spanning over two decades, he has made remarkable achievements, which include leading the development of an integrated platform for cancer vaccine discovery that resulted in a US patent. Sir, we welcome you for your session. Thank 
Je vais How do I get the... How do I get the... The lunch got cancelled, so I have to move fast. Yeah, yeah. Postponed. Oh, sorry, postponed, yeah. So, uh, you know, really want to thank everyone, TM City, um, uh, for inviting. And uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, something which is outside the human genome. You have learned or heard a lot about uh, what we can do by uh, analyzing the sequences of the human genome, both, both in the area of uh, you know, medicine, but also in the area, in other areas. So I'm going to focus on uh, an area uh, that has been neglected for, you know, many, many years, maybe centuries. And now, because of technology, uh, this area is becoming, uh, you know, more uh, tractable. So now you can analyze. Uh, so this is our microbiome. So let me give you a brief uh, uh, just a few background on microbiome. So the idea is that we knew that our body has bacteria, uh, you know, since 1676 when Lewin Hoke, uh, you know, actually found and saw bacteria in our, in the, you know, saliva. But then how many bacteria, what is the magnitude, what is the diversity, it almost took like uh, 300, more than 300 years to appreciate. And that simply because there was no technology that was able to measure quantitate the bacteria that, that we have uh, in us. Then came, as you know, Sam and others mentioned, the next generation sequencing, with which uh, people were able to associate the diversity changes that happen in our body, in the, micro, in the microbiome that we carry, uh, to diseases. And then in 2022, the first product got approved by FTA, which is a you know, fetal trans or fecal transplant uh, that can uh, actually cure a disease uh, which is the Clostridium difficilis uh, infection. So you can see that from 1676 till 2022, uh, we have achieved in you know, a lot. So what do we know about our microbiome and what is unknown? So here it's, you know, taken from an infographic from WHO. And you can see that we know that there are maybe 5,000 species of bacteria and other uh, organisms. Uh, there are 316 million genes. Uh, but there are a lot of things which are still unknown because we have not been able to map them properly and so on. So what is, what is going to surprise you? I'm sure you know that 
we have about uh, you know 13 trillion cells in our body but if you look at the number of uh, bacteria that we carry it's like three to four times in the number of cells in our body so they play a very important role in a lot of things now people believe that uh, you know even what i'm thinking now is being somehow regulated by my microbiome like the our belief system everything is somehow linked to the microbiome now so every organ in our body has a microbiome which is very distinct from other organs and within an organ uh, there is a microbiome uh, group which we call core microbiome which means that every time you uh, analyze the organ you will find those bacteria present but then there is another set of uh, microbes which constitute our uh, variable uh, microbiome and that is what is more interested in diseases and associated with diseases and now with the new technologies we are able to characterize what is the uh, microbiome that is you know, more or less constant uh, between uh, us as you know as a group and what are the things that varies between individuals in Kerala why they are more healthy than individuals in Bengal I am sure that it has something to do with the microbiome because our genome is almost you know identical in 3 billion we may differ by you know 300 400 thousand uh, nucleotides so let's just see what a microbiome is and my whole uh, talk would be you know very general what i wanted to uh, cover was uh, or will cover is uh, how the microbiome is kind of regulated and this slide shows that environment plays a very important role so this is a study uh, which was done uh, you know in sweden you can see that it's like a 8000 uh, participant study uh, from an age of 8 to 84 and you know as students you would appreciate that a study becomes you know very powerful if you can capture as many variables as many parameters and that is true for any type of study you know most important would be the medicine because uh, a particular disease is associated with a lot of different parameters a lot of different characteristics and if you can capture all of them then the study becomes you know very enriched and you can see this particular study they have captured for each uh, you know uh, like exposure so n is equal to 10 so basically they capture 10 different exposure that an individual can have as a adult as a young adult as children and so all the numbers are the number of parameters so this, this is very critical and then uh, they also had a questionnaire so what did this study actually find so what did what this study found and this is like a, a cluster analysis so you look at all the uh, you know genes all the pathways uh, because you have sequenced the microbiome and then you try to see uh, what bacteria which is shown in the uh, which is shown here these are the names of bacteria and these are the type of diseases that these individuals actually suffered and you can see the bacteria can be classified into two very distinct categories so if you look at the healthy you can see that all these bacteria are more or less absent from healthy individuals who did not have any disease and then you can see that these group of bacteria they are actually associated with a variety of different diseases so it tells you that our microbiome has both beneficial as well as harmful bacteria and therefore when the balance between these two get kind of disrupted uh, that's one of the reasons why we have diseases so we have diseases because of genetic reasons we have diseases because of environmental reasons and then we have diseases because the body's microbiome gets kind of disbalanced so now i i will um, Huh. So now I'll focus on oral cavity because we entered a dental, uh, you know, college, right? So I thought that, yeah, that's very appropriate. And I know there are a lot of uh, dental surgeons and uh, individuals who, uh, so they would find also this quite, uh, so now next time you look at your patients, uh, you will see them in a little different light, knowing that, you know, their mouth has a lot of information uh, that is currently not being captured, yeah? 
So you can see that you know any dental person would know that the oral cavity is quite heterogeneous in terms of morphology. There are hard regions, there are soft regions. Now you will also find that there are a lot of bacteria which are common in all these regions. And then, so these are your core microbiome. And then there are bacteria which are specifically or enriched in certain regions. So what makes the oral cavity very interesting is because within this very small space, uh, you have a lot of niches. So if you can analyze these niches, that gives you a lot of value in terms of capturing uh, parameters. So, so this is very important for, I'll come to that in the next slide. So you can see there are about 700 species of bacteria and um, you know, it's a complex microbiome. Uh, because it is not just the food, it is the, uh, you know, it is the digested product of food that is distributed differently in different regions and that actually gives you the uh, enriched, you know, species that are present in one but not present in the other. So, you know, oral microbiome is still a little neglected. The, everybody studies fecal microbiome, so like our colon, stomach and... So I'm going to argue that oral microbiome is uh, easier and maybe more informative than, uh, you know, than fecal microbiome. So why is it easier? Because sample collection is very easy because everybody goes to a dentist. So the dental person can collect samples and those samples are going to be fresh samples in the, in the sense that when you collect something from the fecal material, the fecal material is, you know, passing through a lot of different you know, organs and so therefore the microbiome that you get is kind of a product of, you know, different regions of our body, which is also important. But the oral microbiome immediately gives you an uh, ability to capture uh, what is there, you know, at that point of time. So that, oh sorry. So that kind of improves your disease risk assessment because you are seeing what is there at that point of time. The second is that in the oral microbiome, the percentage of live microbiome is more enriched than in the fecal microbiome. So you are looking at what is actually alive versus what is actually dead. Normally it is not easy to distinguish between the two, but you will get information from both dead bacteria, live bacteria, and then but the live bacteria proportion is higher in the oral microbiome. And then the last point, which is very important, because in everyone says that, oh, I don't want to uh, step in in an area that is completely unknown. Uh, so in oral microbiome, a lot of bacteria has been associated with different types of diseases. So if you can analyze your microbiome, the interpretation is also not going to be that challenging. So now I'll give you a few examples of what are the different uh, diseases uh, where at least everyone accepts that there is a link between oral microbiome and diseases. So first I come to cancer. Um, I'm sure you, you know that uh, this is one of the uh, early papers published by um, you know, Hanahan and uh, Weinberg uh, in 2000. So they first uh, you know, uh, characterized cancer based on dysfunction in certain biological processes. And these were the 10 processes at that time that they enumerated and then they showed. And that changed the how people started looking at cancer. So now when we look at cancer and when we look at genes, mutations, we try to associate those genes and mutations to all these different functions. And so you can see that by layering one information, which is a mutation in a gene, uh, to a function, that gives you ability to intervene. Like how do I, you know, suppose I have to stop proliferation. Uh, what should I do? What should I look for? So that, that gives you a lot of value. So the reason I'm showing this is because in 2022, they expanded this and now they have put microbiome. Because in the last five years, a lot of information has come from microbiome associated with cancer, correlated very strongly with the incidence of certain diseases or certain cancers. So I'll give you an example of uh, how microbiome is causing cancer. So in, the, in this particular, um, you know, uh, uh, like a, you can see that these are some of the cancer-causing hallmarks, which I showed you earlier. 
And then uh, these are some of the bacteria which are present in the oral uh, microbiome and they affect these processes as you can see uh, by either you know releasing products or directly by activating like for example you know that bacteria has um, you know LPS which can activate uh, TLRs which are present on all our immune cells so the immune cells gets activated so you get inflammation and you know inflammation is really not good because it is correlated or it is related or it is some cases it causes cancer so now we know a little bit about how bacteria can affect or the oral microbiome can affect development of oral cancer so you know, this is just taken from a study so these are like you know pieces of information uh, so you have to go and read the paper and see uh, how these uh, studies were done but you can see that when you compare a uh, cancer with control just by looking at the oral microbiome you can see that there are some uh, bacterial species like this is like a you know phyla or family uh, femicutes you can see there is a decrease in the in the in this particular uh, you know uh, group of bacteria and then you can see that here there is an expansion of this uh, group in cancer compared to the control so you can get these differences and this difference is, and now this is a study that was done with uh, almost like 125 individuals. So this is, uh, you know, summarizing the data that they have got from all these individuals. So this correlation has a value, which means that if I now find someone who has a increased, uh, you know, abundance of this particular group of bacteria, I can at least say, hey, come every month, you know, and show me your mouth because you may be developing an early stage oral cancer. So that can give you, uh, you know, some ability to make an early diagnosis. So this is just an uh, excerpt showing that a Viome has come up. Viome is a company in the US. And they have come up with the diagnostic test that got a FDA, you know, uh, accelerated approval. Uh. So their uh, main uh, technology was that they were analyzing the messenger RNA transcriptome of the microbiome and trying to come up with a test, saliva test, to predict total cancer. So what it means is that some of the information that we have learned from these uh, you know, studies is being applied in a very translational manner to, to cancer. So this is another example of how uh, dental health is, uh, you know, uh, causes or is correlated with pancreatic cancer. So you can see that this is again a, a very large study. Uh, this almost like 5 million people followed for 7.2 years with 10,000 developing pancreatic cancer. And if you just, uh, you know, focus on the first, uh, you know, column, you can see that if individuals are 50 years and less and they, ha they have lost or they have 15 to 20 teeth, which means many of the teeth they have lost because of uh, you know, different types of dental uh, problems, they have a very high risk of getting a pancreatic cancer. Now this, uh, if you are 50 to 70 and you have, you have already lost teeth, it uh, kind of reduces. So this study shows that some, you know, uh, factors that can be quantitated in your oral cavity can actually, uh, you know, correlate or can predict pancreatic cancer. So I'll be just careful that if I have lost, uh, you know, this many teeth and I'm less than 50 years, I would, you know, try to see, you know, how can you, can I monitor that I'm having cancer or not. So I'm not saying that these are like truth. What I'm saying is that these studies are opening up new possibilities that you can, uh, you know, you can, uh, what should I say, you can, uh, 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 you can employ in your own, uh, you know, discipline in order to, uh, you know, diagnose completely different diseases. So that is the value of predictive biomarker. It will require more studies, but at least it's the beginning. It was a 2022 uh, publication. Hmm? So um, this is another study, and this is a much more stronger study in the sense that a lot of papers have been published showing that how there is a link between oral microbiome and cardiovascular disease. And you know, there are multiple, uh, 
you know, uh, multiple um, uh, uh, changes that actually happen in the oral cavity because of changes in the microbiome. So one is that transmigration of bacteria that actually should be restricted to your mouth, but they actually go through your blood vessel and go in the systemic circulation. And they kind of somehow affect your atherosclerotic plaque. So, and these bacteria normally are not supposed to go into the blood vessel, but because they interact with the endothelial cells, they actually cause the changes in permeability. Now, this, you know, all of you are familiar with that when we have bacteria, bacteria will interact with our immune cells and then causes release of cytokines. And there are many cytokines that are directly linked to atherosclerosis. Then the third is uh, called molecular mimicry, which means that there are certain bacteria that almost will activate your T cells because they're foreign, but unfortunately those activated T cells can actually destroy or damage something that is your self. So the no self and the non-self barrier is somehow you know, broken. And finally, you know, bacteria produces toxins. So I was listening to you know, the gentleman who was saying that you know, someone who has worked at LIC you know, had this sudden you know, like, uh, lips and the mouth got uh, you know, swollen. And I don't know, but you know, there is a possibility that if you release toxin in a local environment, you can actually change a lot of your, you know, the cells will very really respond uh, and can give you those kind of phenotypes. So, so now we learned that, okay, we can, uh, we can analyze oral microbiome, we can interpret oral microbiome, we can actually correlate oral microbiome with diseases. So what is the next step? Can we make microbiome and make a drug out of it? So this is a, a translational potential of microbiome. So as I mentioned, that fecal transplant has been approved, but then there are a lot of other uh, you know, areas, like for example, diet and prebiotics. Like uh, you know, Manoj and others mentioned that you know, uh, we eat yogurt. Now in Kerala, you guys eat more yogurt than we eat in Bengal. So that could be one way that you are preserving the good microbiome, not only in your oral, but also in your gut everywhere, that maybe we are kind of you know, losing it. So by choosing your diet, you can actually change the balance of the microbiome. Then you can actually create drugs, or not drugs, but you can create con you know, like mixture of certain b bacteria that are good, and then use it as a product. You can, you know, one of you was saying that you can engineer bacteria to do a lot of things. So here also you can engineer bacteria so that they can produce good you know, molecules and then use it as a product. So what I'm trying to say is that the, the potential of the microbiome is also kind of expanding as our understanding is expanding. And this is just a, uh, you know, same from the same paper that actually people have come up with a, with a plan of how clinical trials can be done. And there are two approaches. One approach is the top down, this way, which means that you basically isolate bacteria, uh, you know, from different uh, regions, enrich them, and then you test them for their, uh, you know, in vitro and in vivo testing, and then you can take it to the clinic. So this is the uh, top down because you are not you're just trying to enrich with cer certain features. The bottom-up approach is where maybe sequencing and other things are going to be very useful because by sequencing, you will immediately know which bacteria are expanded in your uh, you know, oral cavity or in your gut, and then you can use those bacteria. So it's very targeted because you're going after a certain group of bacteria which you have identified by technologies. So this is a kind of called a bottom-up approach. So it will go through the same pathway, but the selection at the very beginning is different. So, and you can see that now with microbiome products, the number of clinical trials are also kind of increasing. Right? It does not reach the same level as a cancer drug or, you know, uh, or a cardiac drug, but it is kind of increasing over from 2011 to 21 in 10 years. You can see that... Uh, uh, so what I'm saying is that microbiome was something completely foreign, and now it is not. 
technology and everything has helped us to understand microbiome. So now, how do you do a microbiome analysis, right? Um, so, so this is the oral cavity. You can take. Should I? Oh, okay. oh. Okay. So from the oral cavity, as I mentioned, you can take various types of samples from the saliva, dental plaque, tongue, other, and then you will have a you know bunch of different types of bacteria, fungi, you know, candida, like yeast, and then you you will extract the nucleic acid. You can get you know fragmented nucleic acid from dead bacteria. You can get you know, whole plasmids from, or whole plasmid genome from uh, live bacteria. And then you have to do a sequencing. So this is the technology that has revolutionized, you know, many things, including the microbiome. So you can do, as Sam was mentioning, that the Illumina is the, you know, leader of, uh, you know, uh, sequencing. But they sequence, it's called short read sequencing. So they sequence small fragments of DNA, but billions of fragments which later on are brought together to create or assemble your uh, target. And then there is another type of sequencing, which is uh, called um, long read sequencing. So OMT is one, uh, there is a pack bio uh, sequencing. Uh, so if you want to sequence a whole bacterial plasmid, which is what, 30, 40 kb, uh, not plasmid, the, the bacterial genome, you can use OMT and it will just give you the whole sequence. This is also, uh, becoming more and more affordable because these uh, things are like $1,000. Uh, this can be done in any environment. You don't have to have big labs, uh, don't have to air condition it. You know, it works pretty well. Uh, the Finally, there are different types of sequences that you can generate from your uh, nucleic acid. One is you can do 16S ribosomal RNA, uh, which, is, which can give you the uh, uh, identity of, uh, you know, bacteria. Or you can do whole genome, transcriptome, which will give you much higher resolution of what are the variations that you see even within the same uh, you know, uh, gen genus or species of bacteria. So uh, depending upon like what the question is, you can uh, do some of this sequencing. And of course, then you need to have a uh, you know, group to analyze the data. So then, the, so uh, as I mentioned, that you know, now you can see that there are so many companies, mostly in the U.S., you know, few in uh, Europe, and they they are all uh, using the oral microbiome mainly for a wellness check, and some for making therapeutics. Uh, so you can see these are all kind of wellness check. Um, so what do they do? You they will uh, you know ask you to send you know saliva sample. And then they'll give you a report. And you can see that this is a report from you know, one of these companies. So what it tells you is that uh, these are some of the bacteria. So they, this particular company only looks at 10 species of bacteria, out of which there are some which are high risk, known to be associated with diseases, then mid, medium risk, and then low risk. And you can see that this is the bar, which is the threshold, which means that any bacteria whose frequency, so this is the number like the actual number of bacteria that you have. So if this goes above this, then it's like a danger. Now for this, whatever, whoever this individual was, uh, everything is kind of below the uh, black mark. So it, it's good. And these are some of the bacteria that they test. The reason I'm showing is that if someone decides to do a microbiome, uh, like a company, uh, which will give a microbiome analysis, uh, these are the type of, uh, you know, mm, report that you have to kind of generate. And this basically tells you that all these bacteria, and these are the names here, all these bacteria, what are the different types of diseases that they have been associated with? They are not causal, they are association. So it just makes the, you know, your report a little bit colorful, a little bit more informative. And then, you know, we have all uh, heard about One Health. And in this One Health uh, approach, uh, the microbiome is very important because the environmental factors and the interactions that we are trying to capture is actually, uh, you know, present in not only in our, uh, you know, in our physiology, in our own body, but also very 
tightly captured in the microbiome. So studying the microbiome and, uh, you know, uh, from different, you know, individuals, different animals, will also give an indication of health and disease. Finally, so, like, you know, like Dr. Nawaz was saying that, okay, we need to kind of, you know, do research, we need to, so what are the different types of projects that you can do in oral microbiome? Now, this is three, there can be 30 different projects, but I just thought that, you know, what are the things that you can study that will have an immediate kind of impact? So, first is public health monitoring. So, every dentist, or no, let's say the KMCT dental department starts collecting microbiome from everyone who comes there. And then, uh, you know, tries to define, okay, what is a healthy keralite oral microbiome? We have no idea. All the data that I'm showing you is all coming from, uh, you know, Caucasian studies. And then, in different types of dental diseases that people come here for treatment, if you have 1,000 individuals of each different type, of, like, you know, gingivitis, you know, all the period, periodontitis, whatever the diseases are there, if you can now have microbiome analyzed from those individuals, then you have created a database. And the database itself will basically give you a, show you, is there a pattern that you can see between individuals who are healthy or, and between individuals who have dental problems. Within individuals or between individuals with different dental problems, do you see any differences? And then finally, because these are coming from, you know, different age groups, are there any microbial pattern or microbiome pattern that is kind of correlated with long-term diseases, you know, cardiovascular, cancer. So all this will come if you, you know, if this is kind of done. So, and the technology need not be always next gen, you can do quantitative PCR. Uh, so the outcome is that you can give a report, so it can be direct to consumer, you can do a health check, and it, it can be lower cost. Then something which is more like oral disease focused, like in oral cancer, the, the dental, uh, you know, the, the doctors are the ones who first tell the patient that, hey, I am seeing some problem in your oral cavity, go and see a oncologist, because they see, you know, dysplasia, this whitish mark, and, you know, they kind of know that there is something wrong. So, one can now make the microbiome analysis more oral uh, disease focused. Now, here you want to do not only quantitative PCR, but next gen, because you really don't know what to expect. So, this is done when you are doing a little bit more exploratory. Quantitative PCR is when you know what to look for. So, then you quantitate it and see. So, this can help in disease diagnosis, management, and even intervention. You can tell, hey, this is particular bacteria is, you know, high. Maybe if you change your food habits, maybe you can see an impact. The third is that now you are going outside the oral. So you are using the oral as a, uh, as a place to look at other diseases. And so this will definitely require next-gen sequencing. And then this will also give you predictive biomarkers and, you know, have some discovery and, uh, you know, disease intervention. So I think this is my last slide. Uh, thank you for listening. And uh, any questions? Yeah, happy to answer. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Dr. Vijay, head of the physiotherapy department. Uh, the presentation was uh, really a marvelous thing, and I have a few uh, questions to be clarified. You were talking about the microbiomes um, directly related to the uh, cancer-causing agents. Yeah. And, uh, correlated. Yeah, associated. Correlated, yeah, associated. Yeah. And um, is there any positive correlation with the salivary cortisol and uh, the correlated with the cancer because I happened to study a recent literature. Uh -huh. There was a positive correlation for the increased stress and uh, fatigue associated with uh, salivary cortisol. Correct. So, is there any part positive correlation between? I really two? don't know because it's very specialized. But cortisols are generally not made by bacteria because these are pathways that are more uh, mammalian. So, 
whether the cortisol uh, is a direct cause of what people are reporting or whether it is affecting the microbiome, I really can't say. Uh, is there a reverse correlation, for example, the stress and fatigue, is there any correlation with any um, microbes which we can uh, sequence and find out? Uh, so, th there's very difficulty in, uh, because stress and fatigue are, uh, you know, they comes and go. So, it's like not a chronic disease. So, whether, you know, you have two hours of stress or maybe you have two hours of stress every day, whether that can be correlated with changes somewhere in your body, uh, I don't know if there are any studies have been done, but I don't want to... Because uh, there is a positive correlation between the salivary cortisol and the increasing level of the stress and the fatigue. That is possible so because the cortisol is being produced by your own body cells. So they are kind of responding directly to stress and okay, fatigue. Okay. Whether the microbiome can... Of course, the microbiome can respond if your local environment is changing. Okay. Uh, but I am not very familiar in, in this particular area. It's very specialized. Thank you. But thank you for, for the question. Anyone else? Sir, sorry to call there. Microbiomes are the responsible factor for cancer. Microbiomes are changes in microbiome has been shown to be associated with certain cancers. So there, whether the risk, so responsibility is, I, I think what you mean is that causality. That, so micro, so for example, Helicobacter pylori has been causally associated with stomach cancer. Such a causal association in microbiome has not been demonstrated. So in order to demonstrate causality, you have to follow the very old Koch's principle, right? That you first show that X is present or associated with the disease, you are able to culture, isolate and culture X. And then if you take that cultured X and put it into a non-disease condition, you should recapitulate the disease. So that thorough you know, evaluation, I don't think that it has been done with a microbiome. Most of the studies that have happened so far are very strong correlation. So, if so, uh, this uh, cancer is a disease which may be spread from one person to other, no? Cancer is not spread from one person to another. Yes, this, if these microbes are uh, responsible. Huh. So if these microbes are responsible, like for example, you know, Helicobacter pylori, uh, it is a causal of stomach cancer. But Helicobacter pylori will not get transmitted from one individual to another and even if it gets transmitted, whether it will cause a, a, you know, stomach cancer in that individual or not, it's not very clear because all of us have some uh, you know, small amount of helicobacter pylori in that. So there are other factors uh, that also you know, play an important role in development of cancer. So. Uh, That's a very important point. I didn't get So that is another uh, area where oral microbiome plays a very important role. It's that antimicrobial resistance. And, uh, you know, in a pediatric, so there, there, is, there was a study which was published in Nature a couple of years back, that if you look at, uh, you know, pediatric, you know, children who have been exposed to antibiotic, and you look at the antimicrobial resistance, you basically find that the antimicrobial resistance is directly correlated with later you know, other types of, you know, problems that these kids have. So that's a very important area that uh, at least I, I know that in the U.S. people are working on. But I'm not sure in India how much it is done. But oral microbiome is a fantastic place to actually monitor antibiotic resistance. Because, you know, their enrichment, their presence uh, is going to be very easy to, um, you know, kind of... Uh, in a, Yes, yeah. Yes, but uh, there has been no study. Yes, yeah. Uh, no, but I know there are some companies in the US who specifically uh, specializes in vaginal microbiome, and there is a company that actually does that. And that's also very 
an important area because of cervical cancer, because of so many you know, other uh, you know, sexually transmitted diseases. And there, there are companies that are actually working on vaginal microbiomes. I don't know. Oh, compared to cesarean section. I don't know. I, you know. Absolutely. But I know for certain that I have seen, just read, you know, this papers that uh, normal delivery and not normal delivery has a different impact on the baby's microbiome. Yeah, I, do, I don't remember all the details, but I think this was something that uh, has been a, you know, news in one of the, you know, very prestigious uh, journal. So that, uh, you know, and I think there has been a, like a, what should I say, a recommendation that, um, you know, try to have normal deliveries. Because it is just not uh, the, uh, you know, the convenience or inconvenience, but it actually Yes, sir. So okay. then After what do you days, do then? Uh, they, uh, in a starting the antibody therapy, which is the rest of them, you are, if you if we are giving the proper adequate dosage and things. Right, right. but uh, it is not happening. Hmm. So it was sort of satisfying rather than killing the microbes. Ah, so that's what I'm saying, that you know, sometimes uh, diseases are caused because of an imbalance. Yeah. So suppose whatever you are putting without knowing the mechanism, hmm. if somehow it affects the protective microorganism, yeah. hmm. makes them grow over the ones that are not, not yeah. good, it alters, will, the, it alters, the, yeah, yeah, it alters that balance. Yes. Yeah. Okay.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Oh, yes. Sir, I am from the uh, Department of Public and Dentistry. Uh, so you were talking about causality uh, using oral microbiome. And uh, one thing most of the dental diseases have is the origin is always multifactorial. Yes. So um, tr when we do research using this newer concept, uh, I think we'll have to take in a lot of uh, data about um, habits, uh, yes. environmental factors, yes. not only the agent, because uh, it doesn't follow the Cox postulates that yes. uh, one agent, one uh, presence of the agent Absolutely. is enough to cause the disease. Completely. Agree. So, um, could you give some suggestions if we are to take up some research, uh, how can we do that? Because we are still uh, novices in this area. Uh, what I can do is, again, I am not you know, competent in terms of uh, you know, designing, but first thing what you said is absolutely correct. As much parameter as you can collect, the food habit, uh, you know, what are the medicines they are taking, what are the comorbidities they have, are they diabetic, are they cardiovascular diseases, uh, more, just general routine, right, what they do, how many times they brush, you know, what uh, the paste, toothpaste they use. I'm just saying that, so if you collect all the parameters and then you have collected the microbiome information, that one individual is not going to give you a lot of information between what in the whole parameters that you have collected and how is the microbiome of that individual. What it can tell you is that if I have done 1000 normal individuals with no disease or anything in Kerala, you will get a baseline that okay, these are the bacteria that most people have common and then these are some bacteria which are variable. In order to do, in order to find a very strong correlation which can later on help you to do some intervention or you cannot do only one. So you have to do, uh, you know, a population. That's why it showed you that data. Maybe I'll send to Sam or someone or maybe Raju some literature. Okay. And then he can kind of pass it on to to you, and then yeah, you'll find it very informative because uh, yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. <coughs> sir, actually, Kerala government has started uh, that genome data bank and uh, microbiome center of excellence. I think. So. And is it possible that we can associate with them to collect microbiome samples? Yeah. And uh, genome data bank, you are collecting genomes. So similar. Yeah. 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 Yes. So similarly, is it possible to collect the samples of microbiomes with the... Okay. Yeah, and we could... Okay, okay, okay sir. But then when you collect the samples, you have to also collect all the uh, clinical and non-clinical data. Because that is something that the committee will evaluate. Okay. If you just have samples and only five parameters, then, you know, you, the committee would know that the... Uh, that the that when you know you sequence you, or when it is sequenced and analyzed, you may not be able to get a lot of good information. Okay. So, yeah. so is it uh, the microbiome center for excellence? Is it related to this genome data bank? Okay. Okay. Oh, sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Please stay back. Years of research and understanding of the subject shown through. Many of us were fascinated. Now I request Dr. Srinivas Madhur, Professor, Department of Biochemistry, Kem City Medical College, to please hand over the memento to Dr. Amit Chaudhary. This is amazing. You have my picture. I, was, I should have sent a better picture if I knew. <laughs> a younger version of me. <laughs> Before moving to our last session, we go for a short lunch break. Lunch have been arranged outside this hall. Kindly requesting everyone to have lunch and be back after half an hour. We'll start our next session by 2.30.
We have our last session by Dr. C. N. Ramchin, who is an accomplished professional with an impressive 25 year background in teaching, basic research, and drug discovery. As a co founder, CEO, and CSO of MacGenome, he leads the development of cutting edge bio nanotechnology products for the genomics and proteomics market. With an extensive publication record, numerous patents, and research associations worldwide, he continues to contribute significantly to the life sciences and healthcare industry. Sir, we invite you to give a talk on reverse pharmacology and nutrigenomics. Good afternoon, and uh, <clears throat> I'm very sorry that you're all very hungry. I am too. <laughs> you know, normally, <clears throat> you know, post lunch session, most of the speakers tell one thing that you know, because of the the, the the very good food, don't fall asleep. But then that's not happening there. But I just thought one thing to tell you. You know why you fall asleep after the lunch? <clears throat> the food is full of protein and if it is especially supplemented with carbohydrate, protein contains tryptophan. Then tryptophan is a precursor for serotonin. You know serotonin, what is serotonin to do? And this serotonin can activate your sleeping and pleasure system. That's why you are going to go to sleep. <clears throat> and there is something called a, a natural product called valeria. If you add to that, you can really sleep well. Now, if you get an idea, a combination of, and the other thing is that if your food contains a lot of carbohydrate, the glucose can accelerate the transport of tryptophan. <clears throat> so you can get an idea now. A combination of glucose, tryptophan, and valeria can be a good natural product, functional drinks to induce sleep. And in order to get a patent, what you have to do is that you, know, you have to do a cell culture system it is tryptophan, glucose, and valeria, and how synergistically activate. I can tell you, this can be a blockbuster product. So I just got an idea. <clears throat> now what will happen, if you have not eaten, like all of us, what is the problem? Your glucose probably, if you test it, it will be about 70 or 60 or even less. Mine could be 50, I can fall down after some time. <clears throat> Then what will happen? Your brain has to work. The only fuel available is glucose, isn't it? So if glucose goes down, all your system will go higher. Especially you can be irritated, angry, upset. All this can be done. So please make sure that that doesn't happen. <laughs> make sure that, you know, uh, I can complete the talk <clears throat> soon. Normally I have a habit of going on talking. So I will make sure, and Sam already told me, don't talk much. So let me, I know that everybody is angry. <clears throat> now, before going, this is the title. You might not have heard about what is reverse pharmacology and what is nutrigenomics. <clears throat> and before the, uh, quite some time back, I sent the, my PPT to Sam, and Sam has sent it to Amit also, and they combined, they changed a little bit, realized that the combination effect of reverse pharmacology and nutrigenomics, how product can be developed. Then I got an idea, and many of the products I have developed is through 
This is my therapy. Anyway, whatever I am going to talk is the actual experience I have got. I am actually a drug discovery, biology discovery development person. But I am also involved in developing a lot of products and I will show you a list of products that has been developed. Now, before um, going in order to make things simple, let me briefly tell you two or three minutes the abstract of the talk. So, it will be very easy for you to follow. There is a subtle difference between pharmaceutical and nutraceutical. Pharmaceutical products, you know, there is about 400 plus basic drugs are there. And there is something called claims, disease claims. <clears throat> An example, metformin. Metformin can claim that it can reduce the levels of glucose in your body and it can also reduce glycosylated hemoglobin. That is what is called the disease claim. On the other hand, let's say hydroxycitric acid, that has been also implicated in glycolysis, glucose metabolism, etc. But you are not allowed to do that claim. That's the difference. You can tell managing sugar levels. That is the maximum. This is what is called claims. Anyway, so basically there is a difference between pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals. This is I want to tell you. The other thing is that pharmaceuticals are extremely regulated. Unbelievable regulations are there. Nutraceutical, in most countries, there is a reasonable regulation, not much. In India, it is regulated by what is called <coughs> FSSA, Food Safety Standards Association. In the US, it is controlled by FDA under a law called DISH, DISHIA, the Dietary Supplement and Health uh, Education Act. That is called Asia. As per that one, if a natural product is grandfathered, that means before 1994, it has been using by people as an extract, as a full product, there is no regulation. That means US is the best country to introduce a natural product. Absolutely no regulations are there. As long as it is grandfathered, that means people have been using. Now, roughly about 220 such products are there in the US, 220 extracts or, you know, similar things are there. In India, it is about 160. Now, let me tell you <coughs> the market, world market. Very interesting. You know, worldwide, the pharmaceutical market is roughly about 3,000 billion. You know what is Indian pharmaceutical market? It's only about 50 to 60 billion. We are just 1.5%. 1, 1 Such a big country, isn't it? We have 25% of the population. And 30% of that, roughly about 1,000 billion, 800 to 1,000 billion is in the US. Now come to neutricity. What is the world opportunity? Worldwide sales. It is 800 billion. And out of that, 300 billion is in US. You know what is in India it is? roughly about 1.5 billion. So we are not even 1% or like 0.5% or far, far less than the US opportunity. And in the US, 50% of the people use natural product. And because no regulation, but there is a requirement is there. As I mentioned, there is no regulation by FDA is there. But if you want to introduce a product as a natural product at a or as an ingredient, first thing is that you need a patent. Second thing is that a minimal talk study has to be done. Third thing is that you need to have a two independent clinical evaluation has to be done. Fourth is that you need, to, if you want to really become big, you need to develop your brand. So these are some of the requirements. And many times they will ask for pharmacokinetics. That means it is really after taking whether it is in the blood or not. For example, curcumin. So these are some of the things if you want to introduce a product in the US market. If we are having a collaboration, I would suggest that don't focus on Indian market. First focus on US market. It is very easy to introduce provided as I mentioned this can be done. These all four or five different parameters. Now, <clears throat> I go to many, many Indian universities and uh, other places. You know, 50% of most of the places, you know, the research is connected to natural product. You know that. And what exactly they are doing? What they are doing is that, you know, many of these Ayurvedic products, they will extract. There is a guided extraction procedure with an assay, if the assay is there. After that, 
finally what they are trying to do is that you know purify the compound and after purification i don't know what they are doing because a purified compound cannot be used as per the the law world over if it is purified that really goes to as a drug status so this is one of the thing and not only that if it is a drug molecule really many of these can be synthesized very easily there is not necessary to extract a purify and use as a drug and last 20 years nothing has come in the natural product all over the world people are trying to make a drug out of it that is not the required thing what simply people have to do is that use the extract and as i mentioned patent talk study basic mechanism and you know uh, and pharmacokinetics and clinical evaluation you can introduce a product after branding so this is what the whole about natural product development <clears throat> now what i am going to tell is about a new methodology how you can do reverse pharmacology approach you may not be knowing <clears throat> what exactly a simple example i will tell you you know what is aspirin used for aspirin developed 120 130 years back <clears throat> probably about 40 years back 35 years back identified the action of aspirin in cyclooxin cox2 by the way if you take about paracetamol 15 years back there nobody knew the mechanism <clears throat> paracetamol actually acting via mechanism called cox3 is a different type of transcription translation from cox1 intronic region is one of the very very rare interesting thing has been found from intron transcribed and translated to a new protein <clears throat> anyway so aspirin theoretically everyone was using for pain relief isn't it but i don't think anyone is using for pain now most of the people are going for paracetamol or other cox2 inhibitors like brufenando but do you know <clears throat> about 30 years back aspirin has been started using for you know, the blood thinning or platelet aggregation inhibitor what exactly is that when it was started nobody knew the mechanism but luckily at that time they were allowed to do the clinical trials and they found out that 50 and 75 mg is the optimum dose what is required identified now this type of test using otherwise it is called repurposing in the case of normally uh, the existing product in in natural product this what is called reverse pharmacology so testing that in humans then you can introduce if you do not want to introduce if you want to do a proper clinical trial you can study the mechanism and subsequently what was the mechanism is a leukotriene inhibitor in platelet contains a leukotriene receptor and down regulating because that leukotriene which is protruded outside the platelet is in, involved in aggregation process this is what is reverse pharmacology so how this reverse pharmacology and nutri genomics that means nutritional sensors or nutraceuticals or plant based product how that changes the genomics in the, not in not in terms of mutations or in transcription translation process if you know if you take about the gene <clears throat> there is something called you know uh, uh, transcription factor that binds to a particular place transcription factor is a protein so far about 1500 transcription factors are there very well defined about 48 groups are there and these transcription factor binds to the dna and this transcription factor being a protein that can interact with natural ligands which is metabolomics or metabolic products and the transcription can be changed the finally eventually the protein level can be changed the same way natural product also can interact with transcription factor and change the transcription translation finally lot of changes are there so this is what i'm going to talk <coughs> so let's say that a, a nutraceutical is a pharmaceutical alternative which claims some kind of physiological benefits as i mentioned this is very important some kind of physiological benefit but invariably 
if you see, I have worked extensively on curcumin. <clears throat> and one of my product is a blockbuster product called Curculite. At least 200 different products has got that. Curculite, C-U-R-Q-L-I-F-E. Many other products I have introduced. Now, till date, about 11,000 patents plus about 30,000, 40,000 publications are there. Is it a drug? No. There are various reasons. That is the difference between a nutraceutical and a natural product. But still people are buying and using. And if you take curcumin as a zero bioavailability, so you will have to formulate appropriately. So I have several patents connected to that, you know, for the bioavailability. And we have introduced as a nutraceutical in the US market about 15 years back. Now it is about 600 to 800 crore sales just as an ingredient. Now, some of these examples are antioxidants, prebiotics, which you know, probiotics, curcumin, etc. In the US, nutraceuticals are largely unregulated. Dietary supplements are to supplement your diet to improve the nutritional and health status as calcium, vitamin, fibers, etc. Please remember, in the US, this comes under nutraceutical vitamin, but in India, it is again under comes the drug, drug controllers rule. <clears throat> That's different. But remember, nutraceutical, dietary supplement, or plant drugs, plant-based products, these are all interchangeably people are using. It is one and the same. <clears throat> Which I mentioned already, roughly, what is the kind of sales world over. <clears throat> so in Indian, India, it is very little. I think it is about 1 to 1.5 billion only. Now, there is one more category you need to understand, the only place a phyto extracts as drug category under US FDA is only in the US. Now, you know why most of the other countries not allowing phyto extracts as a drug molecule? Because the complexities, because if you are developing as a drug molecule, you need to have very, very clear cut quality control and quality assurance process. As long as that is not there, it is not possible. In the US, this category has come and I have four different phyto extracts has been uh, introduced. I think Veragan and you know, see, um, I, I just forgot some Veragan and um, Catechin. So there are four different products are there, mainly used for skin application. That has a drug status and an OTC status. Now India is expected to get, but then if we have Phytochemical as a drug molecule, it should be a well defined extract. You cannot have just extract and develop as a drug, not possible. In the US also, you need to have only four or five different, you know, extracts are only, sorry, the, 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 uh, the natural product should be there, not 100 to 100. Many times what is happening is the water extract, alcohol extract, methanol extract, acetone extract, hundreds of products will be there. You can develop it as a natural product or nutraceutical, not in the category of um, phytopharmaceuticals. <clears throat> now, this is another session. You can see, these are all called phytopharmaceuticals. These are all not drugs. For example, um, curcumin, capsaicin, ginger oil, epicatechin gallate. So, like that, a series of products, all these are extracted from plants or plant materials. <clears throat> then purify to single entity. Now, these are all approved as a natural product. There is a difference now. If you are developing, you are extracting and developing a single entity, not synthetic, but extracted, you can get, uh, there is something called grass, generally recognized as safe. If you want to do that one, a totally different regulatory process is there under USFDA. So if you do that one, you can do. You can get the approval, a single entity, but then again, not as drug molecule. Again, as a nutraceutical molecule. So, so all these, what I, am sh I have shown here, is a um, nutraceutical, which is purified, not synthetic. And not only that, many of the natural product, synthesizing is very difficult. For example, hydroxycitric acid, probably several, several thousand tons are going to use from India but they can't be synthesized because of chirality problem. Many of the natural products, this is the problem. Synthesizing, because you know, the, the, the optically active 
area that is chiral centers are very very difficult to synthesize so this is the as i just i wanted to tell if anybody is interested to go into natural product development don't go don't try to make it as a drug molecule just make it as an extract and find out some novelty because unless some novelty is there the us people are not going to buy otherwise they will buy as a commodity product for example curcumin if you are extracting everyone is selling between 45 to 55 uh, dollars per kg that can be sold the moment curculife is selling which is containing 12% is 400 dollars this is the difference the price has gone almost about 40 50 times because there is a patent is there and the mechanism everything has is established so i just wanted to tell you what is phytochem what is nutraceutical what is phytochemical <clears throat> what is purified phytochemical now <clears throat> over the years phytochemicals which became drug molecule this is what i wanted to make it very clear in the last 120 years not many many natural products have become drug molecule but many natural product has given a kind of you know lead that means you have got the pharmacophore structure but now if because i am a drug discovery scientist i will not go that pathway at all because there are many other ways once you have the confirmation of the protein you will be able to pick up the structure what is required for for a medicinal chemist to synthesize so the old method is not required but in the so i i always tell to people those who are working that you know i want as this natural product this is a very good inhibitor of a particular enzyme very good drug it will be impossible to make as a drug molecule because drug molecule now should come through a synthetic way especially nc molecule that also is coming down only 20 15 20 molecules have come in the last couple of years so trying from a natural product extract is very difficult please concentrate on as nutraceutical molecule which is a tremendous market is there in the last 20 years only one thing which has come as a drug molecule which you might be all knowing lovaza which is fish oil epa dha mainly epa combination is an ester of Uh, acosapentaenoic acid <clears throat> and uh, you know other way is that you know to make any of these things as a drug molecule is a very complex procedure um so the, the right hand side i have given some planned planned derived drugs like you know uh, analgesics cardiotonic malaria and the hypertensive and muscle relaxant but with the same technology is available or it was available at that time nobody would have gone to do that one because it is much easier to develop a synthetic drug now <clears throat> uh, i mentioned about you know botanical drug and how it is regulated regulated are the supplements and nutraceutical regulated what's the role of fda and dsha which i briefly mentioned fda is the one who control and dietary supplement and health education act they are the one the rules and regulations exactly to be followed this year and as i mentioned grandfather which is 1994 if you are using any natural product or an extract that still do not require any kind of approval in the us if it is something new has come you you have identified a new plant product you can still introduce that one at that time they will ask for all the tox studies the extraction procedure the formulation every detail they will ask still it will be very easy <clears throat> now as i mentioned every country has got a regulatory uh, regulatory framework is there united states european union it is european food safety authority in india if it is fssai uh, japan is food for specific health use and china health foods now two countries one of the most complex place to introduce this natural product is korea and japan because one is you should not have any solvents you cannot extract with acetone you cannot have of course that is everywhere there in your these these are compulsory thing which your distributor will ask that you should not contain mercury cadmium those type of heavy metals and the phytotoxins so all these should be devoid when you are extracting that one and uh, to some extent in india also those rules are there now what is reverse pharmacology <clears throat> the science of integrating documented clinical and experimental hits into leads by transdisciplinary disciplinary exploratory studies and further developing these into 
drug candidates by experimental and clinical research.